how common are hormone imbalances and are they getting worse? And if they are, what's the deal? What's the cause? They're extremely common. And I think it's, um, you know, with all the chemicals, they're, they're, really disrupting our hormones. So you hear people say like, this is an endocrine disruptor. What that basically means is this product or this chemical that's in this thing you're using, what whether it's lotion or makeup or, you know, plastic bottles, it's actually changing your hormone levels over time. So it is, you know, I think it's getting worse because we have so many things coming out that are making us have more and more exposure to chemicals, right? Yeah. And with endocrine disruptors, your body doesn't know the difference, right? So for example, like xenoestrogens, which are fake estrogens and a lot of these chemicals, your body is going to take that in and it looks at it like it's estrogen that your body makes. So your body has to process that. And and if you could be choosing these more dangerous pathways and you're not clearing estrogen properly, this is where we start to see a lot of issues. How does that work? So is it that xenoestrogens have like an affinity for the, I guess, for the estrogen receptor? Mm -hmm. So, okay. And do you, does that cause then a feedback loop with your body's own hormones? So because yeah. I know when you supplement with hormones, your body recognizes it and then produces less of that particular hormone or changes its profile. So that's basically what's happening. Yeah, and it's, they're binding to our estrogen receptors, yes. basically. Yes. So which is actually making our estrogen higher in general, which is estrogen dominance is mm-hmm. something that's driving a lot of issues, even with histamine, which we'll get into in a little bit. It's one of the main drivers right now. Do they test for for xenoestrogen and, and uh, endocrine disruptors? You can. You there, can, yeah. There's, there's a lot of different um, tests. Great Plains Labs mm-hmm. has, um, I, I don't remember the panel, but you can, you can look into kind of stuff like that, but we really look at estrogen. Mm-hmm. I mean, and we know that some of the estrogen showing up on some of the testing, it's it can be this estrogen dominance. And I was listening to you guys earlier talking about the decrease in testosterone. Yeah, that's like over the last like what five or six decades it's been yep. going down in men. And it's because of the rise in estrogen. So this is and these are in what products are you finding these? Is it plastics and plastics? Um gosh, air fresheners, oh, like fragrance. VOCs. So everything the the like carpet, paint, all that stuff. And then any th- kind of product, so lotion, because you know your skin is our biggest organ. So makeup, um, so many different things that you use, you put on your body. If there's chemicals in it, it's going to create that xenoestrogen and then that's going to disrupt your are, hormones. Are there regulations on this? Because it's if, if they're everywhere, I no. feel like nobody's like, I guess you could put these chemicals in and- they don't test for this in that sense. They right. don't test to see if it is that no. is that the deal? Yeah. Okay, so when I'm using one thing that has a potential xenoestrogen, I have maybe a weak effect, but it seems like this is cumulative then. Yeah, because yeah. there's so much, right? There's so many things that can do this. So we use a lot of these things. And so we see a lot of men in our practice who are their testosterone's tanked and then their estrogen is high. And they're they have no idea why. And it's because of the products, you know, or things even you're cleaning your house with can do it. What are the symptoms in in women with some of this stuff? What are, like if, if someone's listening right now and they're like, okay, well, what symptoms do I look for to know if this is me? Weight gain, mood yeah, swings, PMS, fatigue. Especially yeah. with excess estrogen, you can have acne, um, heavy periods, you know, long cycles. This is um, even weight gain. Weight gain is a big one. Yep, even endometriosis, too, yeah. fibroid cysts. Estrogen dominance affects men and women. So when you're trying to work with helping the body clear estrogen, you really have to take a backward approach, meaning you have to really support the liver. Right. And you really have to dive into gut health because a lot of our estrogen is metabolized through our urine and through our stool. So if you're it's like a compiling effect. Right. If you're getting in all these xenoestrogens, you're dealing with tons of stress. You're you're dealing with tons of infections in the gut or you're not metabolizing properly right through that liver. It's just an accumulation. Your body's reabsorbing a lot of this because we need to get rid of that hormone when we make it. So if you don't get rid of it, 
then it stays in the system and it continues to recirculate. Can, yeah, if yeah. you're not pooping, mm -hmm. forget it. So yeah. is constipation, does that increase? Oh, big one. Really? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, if a woman has symptoms, like you mentioned earlier, acne, like PMS is really bad, like weird weight gain, mm -hmm. also constipated, mm -hmm. yeah. that's one of the first places that you'll end up looking. Yeah. Now, when, when somebody's in this situation, Walk me through what are some of the things you do. You look at the products they're using and say, okay, stop using these products. Is that the first thing you do? It's definitely a, a big part of it. So you got to definitely eliminate inflammatory foods, right? That's first and foremost. So you want to assess your diet, yeah. staying away from a lot of the sugar, a lot of processed dairy. Um, gluten is a big one. Industrial seed oils are big. So really eliminate a lot of the inflammation there. Then you want to look at your products, right? Look at the products like the xenoestrogen. So staying away from fragrance parabens, phthalates, things like that, BPA. So, you know, store your food and not plastic, right? Um, more so glass containers. And then you want to really support your detox pathways because this is a big one because, you know, these pathways, they work so hard for us, but they get overburdened. So if you think about it, our lymph system, our liver, our bowel movements, sweating, all of these things happen without us even having to think about it, but they get overburdened from stress and these chemicals and all the crap that we're exposed to that we, that a little bit is out of our control, right? The air, all the things, right? Mm -hmm. So we really want to take a supporting approach in that way. And then to really support hormones, you got to dive into gut, got to dive into gut and support liver. So do you think, because alongside with, you mentioned earlier, Becky, the, the declining testosterone levels, mm -hmm. they're also along those lines, we've been seeing declining fertility rates yeah. in women. Do you think those are connected? And what's yeah. interesting too is now that I'm thinking about it, I think they've noticed the lowering testosterone over, I want to say the last five decades. That seems to be when a lot of these products started to be, kind of permeate the market. You yeah. know, when you start to see more plastics, more waxes and, you know, um, like nonstick coatings and stuff like that started yeah. to permeate the market. So do you guys think there's connected that the, the drop in fertility is connected to all of this stuff? We see a lot of people with infertility and it's crazy because once we go through their products mm -hmm. and we start working on supporting the liver so that they can metabolize their hormones properly and then start working on their gut health. And sometimes yeah. we will order all this testing, right? So we order the gut testing, the hormone testing, all this stuff. But first we start them on an, a low inflammatory diet and liver support and we have them really support their detox pathways. And before we can get to their testing, they're pregnant. Wow. <laughs> and it's this crazy. is people who've done IVF. They've they've gone through it, right? And they'll we get these portal messages and yeah. they're like pregnant. I mean, we see it all the time. Mm -hmm. And we're like, wow, all we did was support your detox pathways and change your diet. What 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 does a low low inflammation diet look like? So you want to take things out like um gluten and some, you know, grains can be inflammatory for people. The industrial seed oils, mm. um, sugar. gluten, sugar. I mean, sugar is probably the worst thing. You know, it's really, really inflammatory. And just really processed packaged foods that they have all these fillers in it, you know, to keep them uh, shelf stable, right? So we want people to eat stuff that's going to go bad if you don't eat it in a couple of days or you have to freeze it. So basically lean or, you know, not even lean, I guess, but, you know, organic proteins, like we're very into, you know, Shop animal protein. From yeah. the grocery store, right? Exactly. <laughs> Stay, Stay away, away from, from those the middle. aisles. Farmers markets. Yeah. Get to know your farmers, right? Co-ops. There's so many amazing yeah. resources out there to, to eat healthy. Does just cutting cal because I so I see this in my space, right? In fitness, that we notice that just by cutting calories, we see improvements in the traditional blood markers, mm -hmm. blood lipids, uh, triglycerides, that kind of stuff. Heavily processed foods, which is a lot of what you guys are talking about, mm -hmm. encourage overeating. I mean, they do, right. they've, they've done studies where they show it's like, I think on average, you'll eat 600 more calories a day, even if the macros are controlled for just because these foods are, are engineered to make you overeat. Does just reducing calories lower inflammation as well? Not always, okay. because if it's a calorie is not a calorie, you right. know? So if you're reducing calories, but you're eating those hundred calorie snack packs, mm. No, of course not. That's going to re that's going to increase your inflammation. So, it's more about getting nutrient dense foods like adding organ meats, 
you know, just making sure your food is clean. Mm -hmm. And we really don't do calorie counting with patients for the most part. Sometimes we will if someone's really having an issue with weight, but we don't really have to. We just kind of give you like, this is the best foods to eat. And those foods tend to be, they make you feel more satisfied, right? Because you're not eating all that sugar and processed food, which makes you more hungry. So you're eating more healthy fats and protein, you're full, like yeah. you feel good. I just saw a statistic today, Adam pulled it up earlier, that the 100 years ago, the average American consumed a half a pound of sugar a year. <sighs> today, the average American consumes 157 pounds of sugar a year. So essentially, wow. a half a pound of sugar a day. So we went from half That's a pound crazy. a year to half a pound a day. So it's a massive difference in the amount of sugar that we consume. Um, which has got to play a role in, in in some of this stuff. You were talking about gut health. Let's get into that. So I've had gut issues for a long time. We all have. <laughs> yeah. I, well, you know, you're right. It's, it's such true. a super, super have. common. Yeah. What are some of the first places you look when somebody comes to you and says, you know, I, I have constipation, bloating? Yeah, like, we do a stool test. So okay. we look to see in the large intestine, um, do you have an imbalance of good bacteria to bad bacteria, which is called dysbiosis? We look to see, do you have yeast overgrowth? Do you have parasites? Do you have H. pylori, which is a, a certain type of bacteria, which is actually pretty common. We see it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, do you have leaky gut, which is extremely inflammatory? So, so we look at all those things. And what happens when you have those things is that, you know, certain types of bacteria create inflammation in the body. So inflammation in the body causes you to get inflammation is at the root of everything. So it causes you to gain weight. It causes your hormones to go off balance. It causes your pituitary gland, which is kind of like the control center to like telling all the other glands what to do. It causes that not to function properly. So, you know, you really have to make sure that it's, it's like adding fuel to a fire, right? So if you have bacteria that's creating more histamine, let's just say for an example, which histamine is an inflammatory chemical. Mm. So we need histamine, but we don't need excessive amounts of histamine. So if if you have too much bacteria, which is making you produce more histamine, then you're going to have these issues. And the same thing with candida, which is a yeast overgrowth. And the same with, thing with parasites. Like they're all making you very inflamed. And and you're, you know, 70% of your immune system is in your gut. Yeah. So it's going to affect you in so many different ways. And then there's like the the uh, gut brain connection and the gut skin connection. It, it's all so related to the gut. Yeah. When my gut's off, uh, my mood is different. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm definitely more irritable. Um, I feel like slightly depressed, yeah. I would say. Mm -hmm. It definitely makes that. So let's. I want to back up for a second. I In my experience, when I've met functional medicine practitioners, the vast majority of them came to functional medicine because of their own struggles with trying to figure out their own health issues. Like they went through the traditional route, couldn't figure it out, had to do their own reading, had to do their own research, had to go, you know meet with different people, eventually figured it out after years. And that took them down that path. Did both of you? Both. Oh, yeah. Is that oh, really? All. I mean, <laughs> I was sick. I mean, there was a time when I was living in mold I could not drive my kids to school. I couldn't walk to the bathroom by myself. It was, I thought, I honestly didn't care if I was alive anymore. And the only reason I did is because of my kids. It was that bad. So. And you didn't know, you couldn't figure out what it was for a long time or. Well, I, I have such a nose for mold. So I thought for sure I would know if I was living in mold. And um, I had, this is, this was like, after I'd already been doing functional medicine. So I had gone into functional medicine because I had a thyroid issue that nobody could diagnose. And then I figured that out with another functional medicine practitioner. I got a lot of help, felt a lot better. Then I started, you know, knowing there was some symptoms left and that was mast cell activation syndrome and causing histamine intolerance. Okay, okay then I learned that whole picture and I felt great. And then all of a sudden... I, there was a couple things. One was um, a very stressful environment I was living in, which was really making me very sick. And then 
was the mold picture. So mold happened right around the same time. And those two things together, I mean, I literally thought I was dying. So I did start helping people before this, but that made me get really, like, really serious yeah. about this and start talking about, you know, other things. And that's why we talk a lot about mold um, because we know how how terrible it is and we see a lot of, of patients really who sad. have the, it's ruining their lives how did I you mean, how did you end up figuring it out did you have to have someone come in well and I you? actually had my breast implants removed because I thought I had breast implant illness I thought I did all the testing on my gut my hormones everything was fine and I'm like what is going on with me I felt like I was drunk every day when I woke up and I had the worst brain fog. I mean, I literally felt like I was walking around in a constant dream. She couldn't see patients. I couldn't see bad. patients anymore. I couldn't drive. How I long literally ago was this? this was five years yeah, ago, was, maybe. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. So um and then and then I and then so I got my breast implants out and I ended up moving into a different room of the house and the mold was in the room I was sleeping in. I, the, it was coming there was a crack in the concrete. Water had gotten in and it was forming this perfect like nest of mold because there was a picture underneath the bed and the mold was coming, the water was coming up through the floor and creating this just perfect environment. So I couldn't smell it. So I was sleeping in this bed every night. So anyway, after I had my breast implants taken out, I moved into another room for recovery because the bed was like reclining, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. And I was like, wow, this surgery, this is so, this is it. You know, like this was Oh my what God, it was. so totally confirm what you thought. Yes. No. No, yeah. It was, I thought it was the breast That's implants. what I mean. You confirmed yeah. that, but that was wrong. But it wasn't yeah. it. Yeah. So then I, so then we went to move the bed to get a different bed. We picked the bed up and the smell was insane. And I was like, Oh my gosh. And we lifted up the picture and just black mold. I oh mean, my all gosh. over. So I had to move out, remediate. I mean, all that. And then I was great. Wow. So do you find people who, who have mold issues? And I mean, a lot, a lot of people. And the symptoms of that are like what you said, brain fog. And it can be for some people like congestion, trouble with breathing. They get like that kind of stuff going on. But other people, it's really bad brain fog, really bad fatigue, body aches. You just feel kind of sick and can like you, you have the flu. Can you test someone for mold oh, or do you yeah. have to go to yeah. the house and test it? Oh, okay. Nope. We test the body first because it's cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really is. But then, you know, you want to make sure that someone's out of the environment too. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people will go, well, I lived in a wet basement, you know, when I was a kid. And we don't know, is it from that or are you are currently living in it? So we we do both. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And then Crystal, how about you? Did you, what brought you into functional medicine did you have your own oh yeah i went through so many hormonal it was a hormonal cascade remember that mm -hmm. back yeah so you know going through grad school right was stress on the body and then having kids and opening up businesses and all the things my hormones were just crazy after i had declan so i started doing some testing i'm like something has to you know, I have to do something. I was gaining weight. My face was breaking out. I was feeling like I was jumping out of my skin, like rage almost, which was not like me in That's the least. That's not her personality no. <laughs> at all. So I was like, what is going on? So I started doing testing and testing. And, and sure enough, I had estrogen dominance. I had higher testosterone. Um, and I also had gut infection. So once I really honed in the stress aspect, really worked on these drivers, a lot of these symptoms went away, right? And that's when I was like, I got to help people. I got to do this. And you're so, like, I'm going in this direction. Oh, yeah. 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 And how long ago was this for you? This was years ago. It was probably, probably 10 years ago. what, 10 plus. Yeah, yeah 10 plus years ago. ago. Did you guys yeah. know each other back then? Yeah. We yeah. went oh, to school together. Oh, you did? But we weren't close then. No. But she graduated earlier than me. Yeah. And then I graduated. And then we connected after kids. Mm. Yeah. And then the rest is history. Look at, us yeah. now. Look at us now. Do you guys find, um, do you guys find more women seek out functional medicine yes. practitioners initially? Oh, yeah. Okay. And the reason why I asked that, by the way, is because uh, of moms. And yeah. moms with their kids, they just, they, they, you know, they really pay attention. They notice changes and differences. I see this with my wife and she's very much on it. Like we got to figure out this mm -hmm. root issue or whatever. So you guys see a lot more. We do because women are a lot more in touch with their feelings. You know, like if they feel something, they acknowledge, okay, this is off. And I think a lot of men 
have been taught from a young age to Ignore get up and it. dust it's yourself so off yeah. and don't cry and you're fine, right? right. So even when we have this uh, metabolic assessment form that we do in everybody, and it's a zero <laughs> to three, zero is the best, three is the worst. And men are like zero, 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 zero one, zero, zero. <laughs> Women are like so three, true. three, 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 two, zero, three, three, three. Like, it's so funny. Do you have, or, have like a key? Like, okay, yeah. we're this like, over. this is man. Or this the, is the, the man wives version. will fill it out for the husbands yeah. and show up on the appointment. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The wives yeah. call. Hey, sorry to interrupt. Look, I have a free guide that teaches you how to lose fat in three steps, just three steps that will burn the most amount of body fat and help keep it off. This guide is totally free. We're giving it to everybody right now. If you want it, click on the link at the top of the description below. All right, back to the show. To make the appointments a lot of the time. <laughs> Unless it's a cold. If we get a cold, it's way worse. Yeah, oh, then you're dying. To support that, by the way. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. How I train a, a female client that says, I want to be sculpted, fit, tone is the exact same way that I trained someone to be a, a muscle mommy. But back then you couldn't say that because people- We had to be very careful yes. with how you communicated it. You had to encourage people in a very thoughtful way because women were afraid of getting bulky or big or masculine. They were told that strength training uh, and eating more and fueling their body- was wrong that mm -hmm. that was wrong. I mean, I mean, let's 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 talk about this for a second. I mean, I started in the late '90s, and for a long time, first off, the weight room was dominated by men. You didn't see women in the free weight area. You saw some women in the machine area, but they were typically relegated to the adductor or abductor machine, maybe the you know the donkey kickback machine. You know, some of the exercises with the pink upholstery. And I'm not making this up. Literally, the gyms I worked in, they would they would put make the upholstery a different color to attract women. And they weren't even doing strength training. They were encouraged to do Circuit. lots and lots of reps, no rest periods. It was all, all about burn, burn, burn. And then you started to see kind of this slow drip and change. I remember when it really started to first happen because for a long time, one of the biggest struggles I had a tra as a trainer, because uh, this is by the way, true industry-wide, Personal trainers, if you're working with the general population, the majority of your clients are going to be women. So at least 65 to 70 percent of your clients will be women, and it's still that's still true uh, today. So you work with women um, all the time, and, and it, it, I remember when I had to go from really convincing women, like deadlifting, squatting, pressing, rowing. Like this is, I know you said you want to get skinny. I know you said you want to lose weight. This is the best way to do it, and I'd have to educate and really encourage and teach my clients through a long process. And then you started to see women start to see representatives that they identified with. CrossFit kind of did this a little bit in the fitness space where all of a sudden women were like, you know what? I think I think I do want to lift weights. I think it does make me look the way I want to look or the way I think I'm going to look by getting on the treadmill and running for two hours and, and eating a salad um, all day long. And that slowly started to change. We started the podcast almost 10 years ago and when we would communicate this message, it was like light bulbs were going off. We still got pushback, but we had a lot of women that would write in and say, oh my gosh, like this is, no wonder it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. No, I, I've done exactly what you said would happen, which is I would lose some weight, end up losing muscle because I felt weaker and I, 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 I was smaller, but I didn't look better. And then my, my weight loss would plateau. I'd be doing hella cardio. I'm eating almost nothing. Mm -hmm. And eventually I'd gain the weight back and then some, and I'd repeat that cycle. And what you're explaining is exactly what happened to me. Like what you're saying now makes a lot of sense. I'm a little afraid though. I'm still afraid to really try to build my body. Am I going to get big? Am I going to get bulky? And we would have these conversations. We did episode after episode after episode on this. And slowly but surely, the industry is starting to shift. And that's why I think this ep this this program, that's why Mo Mass Muscle Mommy's crushing because I think women are finally like, oh, you know what? I'm ready it's to take a pain a point. Yes. You know, this is something that's just been blasted their way forever. And it's just like, it's not working because once you get to that point where it's like a plateau, like the only answer that was provided was just eat less and then move more, eat yeah. less, move more, burn more calories. Like literally women would be just like eating barely anything, you know, for, for years and just trying to, to survive on that just to fit a certain size. So too, I think a lot of fashion, like really leaned into that. Whereas like the size of clothes, like, and everything was like very much framed to this, this skinny, uh, portrayal. And, and so, yeah, it's so great to see this, this shift and this movement more towards 
being healthy, being strong and, and, you know, still looking great and having that, the, the curves and the natural uh, look that they're going for to begin and, with. And feeling strong. Yeah. Do you guys think that, um, do you think a lot of this comes from CrossFit, you know, to give credit where credit's due? I feel like. I think the beginning of it, I definitely think that CrossFit did more for strength training for women than the fitness industry did uh, ever leading up to that point. Yeah, um, <clears throat> women weren't lifting weights unless they wanted to be bodybuilders, which nobody did. Um, they weren't really lifting weights. And then what CrossFit did is it had, so, through social media, right? You would see these CrossFit women who presented these like sculpted, lean physiques. And a lot of women were like, wow, that looks cool. And look what she's doing. She's doing pull-ups and yeah, she's squatting she's like cool thing. And look, she's got a round butt and I want to look like that. And so I think it, it opened the door for the conversation, even though, especially early days, CrossFit um, programming was, wasn't great. We did episodes on this, but it did open the door. It definitely did open the door to strength training being not just a great form of exercise, but one of the best forms of exercise especially for women who want to be lean, fit, mobile, healthy, who aren't, who don't want to work out every single day, who aren't just trying to starve themselves. It did open the door. It opened the door for that conversation. Yeah. It really feels like the timing was perfect in the space because I feel like the, the eighties and nineties, you know, model was just starting to fade out in the early 2000s. Yeah. And then early to mid 2000s is when CrossFit really started to take off. And so I think it was this perfect timing of the the skinny Coke model was no longer the look anymore. Or we started to realize like, oh, how unhealthy that was and how oh that didn't look really that good either. And I think that was already starting to become the conversation. And then here comes this sport where you have, like you said, these bodies and women that are extremely capable, you know, that are doing things, doing these crazy feats that are stronger than a lot of other dudes that are like trying to lift this. So it was like, I think it was a really important time in our culture that, and it just was perfect. And I think CrossFit had a lot to do with that. It did. And I'd like to say that we played a bit of a role. Mm. I mean, we do, yeah, lead, I want to take some credit. We, we do lead the, the <laughs> we lead the podcasting space and we had for a long time in the fitness space. <laughs> And look, Adam, you're you're the you're definitely the business uh, genius of the group. Uh, look at the shows that have done the best, the episodes that we've done that have gotten yeah. the most reach. What were they? It was the the early episodes. Well, the very first, well, the first viral one ever was uh, women's fitness myths. Uh -huh. Yeah, top women's fitness myths, which we addressed all. Why this. women should bulk. Yeah, uh, our episodes around women and metabolism and eating more protein and why they need to strength train, why they need to get stronger. Those episodes took off. Now, luckily, we have a, a, a platform where we have long-form communication, so I can break down and explain why, right? Because the average person might not understand, but here on a podcast, I can break it down and say, look, if you gain 10 pounds of muscle and you lose 10 pounds of fat, you're smaller because muscle takes up less space. It also shapes and sculpts your body, but that's not the best part. Now you have a faster metabolism, meaning you burn more calories all the time. In fact, a fast metabolism will burn more calories every single day than you getting on a treadmill for an hour every single day. So it's even more effective than that. So then when I can really explain that and break it down and why that happens, people are like, oh, I'm not afraid of lifting weights. Oh, this makes perfect sense. Yeah. And then when they try it, here's the deal. When you do it right, when you fuel your body the right way, meaning you don't starve yourself, but you feed, your, you feed the adaptations you're looking for. And what are the adaptations we're looking for? Strength muscle. We want the hormone profile that, that tends to lead to that, right? So nice balance of estrogen and progesterone growth hormone. We want cortisol to be appropriate, not always high or not crashed into the floor. We want insulin sensitivity. We want good testosterone levels, which is also very important for women. Like and when they try it and they feel it, here's what ends up happening. Uh, people come back to us and go, you know, what's weird. I've been doing what you're saying. I'm, I feel like I'm doing less work than I've ever done before. I, I don't, I'm not beating myself up. I have all this energy. My libido's through the roof. Um, I, the scale says I lost eight pounds, but everybody around me says I look like I lost 15 pounds. My clothes are looser. I feel empowered. And then what's crazy is I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm eating more than I did in the beginning. 
like you were you were right and i i don't ever want to go back to the old way again well i think you know initially we were talking about like why this is a revolution i think like it, it, you know in the beginning the coke model kind of era and then it kind of shifted over and crossfit sort of open the doors towards more women like lifting weights, but it was definitely a pendulum swing to the extreme. And we saw that because I mean, nutrition was a bit of a highlight, but it was like still really low calorie yeah. and everybody was overtraining. Yeah. And so this is where like, it, you know, we're kind of coming back and, and too, like even in culturally speaking, like there was this big movement to uh, push like health at any size. And, and um, you know, the, the fact disregard the fact that, you know, you have a lot of, uh, excess amount of pounds that, you know, need to be lose. Um, so, you know, I feel like now after all of the dust is settled with a lot of the realization that like, wow, like our culture and everybody's really unhealthy. I think like health is finally like equal to, to fitness and strength. And this is something that's like finally kind of merging together. And I think the muscle mommy really represents that well. well. When people understand that, you, you know, cause what drives us often, me included when, especially when I first started working out, what drives us to exercise or change our diets initially. And, and sometimes it's like this for a long time is that we want to look better. I mean, let's just be very honest, right? People say they want to be healthy. They say they want to improve all these different things, but really what drives them is like, I want to look better. I just want to look better. I want to be more attractive. I want to look a lot better in my clothes, out of my clothes, the whole deal. But when you understand that health equals the look that you really want, then it's really about just getting healthy, getting healthy in the right way. When you're healthy in the true sense, you'll have a good lean body fat percentage, not ripped to where your hormones crash to the floor and you're not feeling good, but a nice lean healthy body fat percentage. You have adequate muscle that moves your body, produces strength, and you can see it from the outside. You have shape. It looks like you can move yourself. It looks like you're mobile. You've got glutes and hamstrings. You've got good posture. You know, you've, your, your arms look sculpted. Like everything looks uh, really, really good. You've got good energy. Your hair and your nails and your skin reflect this. By the way, studies show this. Strength training makes your skin look better. Other forms of exercise not necessarily. Now, why is that? When you strength train, especially when you feed yourself appropriately, it boosts collagen production. Collagen's protein. Co okay, collagen is a, a protein that your body builds, just like your muscles. So when you strength train, you send that signal to build and you feed it appropriately. You don't just build your muscles, you build your skin. Same thing with your hair and your nails. So a healthy look is the look that people want. The problem is when people just go for the look, they end up compromising their health and they get mm -hmm. neither. They get none of, of either one. So as people are starting to understand this, it's like, oh my God, like this makes perfect sense. Plus, um, I mean, isn't that the way you want to go? Isn't that where you want to go with this? Yeah. I, so this is interesting that, uh, you know, we're here, right? So this weekend I had just got back from my Seattle trip and I was with all my family and my cousins and, you know, they're my cousins. I don't get a chance to see very often. And yet a lot of them actually do pay attention to what we're doing in the space and fitness. And, uh, a couple of them really want to lose weight and they want to lose more than 30, 40 pounds worth of weight. And I'm sitting there kind of explaining to them, uh, how they have done it in the past I was thinking to myself, like, what do you think is the most difficult part to communicate this to? Um, for me, I, I, as I was explaining to her, I'm like, you know, what 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 part of this is so hard for them to understand? And I think the the part that I came to was it's one way is working with your metabolism, and then the other way is working against it. And so that and understanding that there's a way that you you can do this to where you're actually working with your body to try and obtain these results. And then there's another way you can try this and you're literally working against your body. And then the ability to be able to communicate that in, in its simplest form so they can grasp that understanding. I think that's one of the most difficult things to do. It is because people equate calorie burn to movement, right? <clears throat> so the more I move, the more calories that I burn. Uh, but your body burns a lot of calories maintaining itself as well. Um, and the way you move makes a difference in terms of how you burn those calories. So all activity burns calories, um, but only some forms of activity teach your body to burn more calories on its own. Uh, that's what strength training does. Strength training as a side effect, because the main effect of strength training is to build strength. Okay, to be very clear, that's the main adaptation. If I strength train, I'm going to get stronger. If I do it right, that's what I'm aiming for. The side effect of that, though, is your body requires more energy to maintain itself. 
if you've built a little bit of muscle and you feed your body appropriately to do so, in other words, your body doesn't feel like calories are scarce <clears throat> and it's in the process of building muscle and you're not trying to be so active all the time to burn those calories all the time, which I'll get to in just a second as to why that's not necessarily a good thing from a getting leaner perspective, then one of the adaptations is you get a, a, a metabolism that burns more calories. This is why if you do this the right way, you, 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 the, the weight loss doesn't start quickly and then plateau super hard. It's more of a snowball effect as the metabolism kicks in. So to give an example, I mean, I'll, I'll use a typical client, like typical client example, I would have a client who um, would train with me and they would switch from their traditional workout, which was a lot of back in the day, step classes, aerobics classes, spin classes, cardio, to traditional strength training, maybe a couple days a week, two or three days a week with me. And I would slowly fuel their body for that extra muscle. Their caloric intake would go up. It would go up at the end. At the end, when most people expect their caloric intake to be at this low point that they have to maintain. In other words, somebody would come to me and be like, and they're maintaining their weight at 1800 calories and they're doing all this cardio like crazy. And then over the course of the next few months through strength training, reducing the activity they were doing because it wasn't uh, <coughs> serving us, they would be eating 2,300 calories. So you're burning 500 more calories and you're, you're doing way less cardio and all those crazy activities and you're leaner. Um, I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to understand which one's more sustainable because the other thing you have to consider is this, you have to live in the real world. Uh, if you're watching or listening to this, the odds are you live in a modern society where food is plentiful. It's tasty. We do a lot of things with it. It's it, with food to celebrate and to enjoy people and to whatever it's convenient. A fast metabolism 10,000 years ago wasn't a great idea. Like if, if your body burned 3000 calories a day, and you're a hunter gatherer, like you're in trouble. Like you got to find 3,000 calories a day. Yeah. But a metabolism that burns 3,000 calories a day, you know, in, in, in a modern society is an asset because you can burn those calories off. Um, all of the negative effects from food that can happen, even bad foods, even quote unquote bad foods, a lot of it goes away if your body's able to uh, burn it off. So a fast metabolism is what you're looking for if you want to get lean, not a slow metabolism. Now let's go back to slow metabolism. What am I talking about? Well, if you're training and exercising in a way that tells your body, hey, in order to get better at this activity, I need to become more efficient of a machine, more efficient with my calories, your body will slow its metabolism down. What form of exercise encourages your body to become more efficient with calories? Cardio, mm -hmm. lots of cardio, lots of cardio, because in order to get better at cardio, you don't need a lot of strength. You need very little strength. So your muscle, your body actually says, we don't need much strength and we're burning all these calories, what we need to do is pare this muscle down so that this person can do this much better. And you'll build more stamina and endurance. So cardio does build, build lots of endurance and stamina. But when you do that, especially when you combine it with calorie restriction, you slow your metabolism down. This is why you go on a diet, you add three days of cardio, you lose 10 pounds, then you plateau. What's going on? Oh, I know what I need to do. I got to cut my calories more. I got to do more activity. You lose a little bit more weight and you plateau again. Uh oh, I think I need to do more. I need to eat less. And then you're in this place where you're like, I can't do more. doesn't fit my lifestyle or I just, I don't want to do that. I'm eating so little that when I go on a week a vacation with my husband or I step out of my There's diet no for a couple of days, flexibility at all. I, I gain all this weight. Yeah. Like this sucks. This, this doesn't work. And so that's what women were encouraged to do for a long time. And by the way, this isn't just what we experienced. So we saw this as trainers and gym owners and managers in the fitness industry for two decades. We know this, by the way. Trainers and coaches watching this, what I'm saying, this, none of this is new. They're all nodding their head like, yes, I know this. But you know what's funny is now we have the data to support it. Look at the studies on strength training versus other forms of exercise for pure fat loss. Mm -hmm. Strength training beats the crap out of other forms of exercise. Look at strength training versus other forms of exercise for longevity, for hormones, for movement, for all that stuff. It beats the snot out of all those other forms of exercise because it is the superior form of exercise for fat loss. But it also, also the only form of exercise where you can look at yourself and you can spot sculpt your body. I can literally develop more of this, develop more of that, develop more of this because that's what strength training does. I work different muscle groups and parts of my body. And yes, you're definitely limited to a large extent by your genetics, but that small, there's a small margin where you can manipulate how your body looks through strength training. So bodybuilders do, of course, as they manipulate how their body looks. I, I think there's this massive uh, misconception around how irrelevant scale weight is too. 
you know, we were talking, uh, Katrina and I, just last week about like this journey. And part of why we were talking about this is because uh, she's been teasing me with the trisepatide weight loss and yeah. the back and forth. And right. So it's been like this home joke, right? About, oh my gosh, you're going to get so skinny. You're going to be so small. Right. So she's poking at that insecurity. Right. And uh, she's like, no, I'm, you know, and she's like, you know, I'm just playing with this. And of course I know that. And she goes, you know, it is really wild. We've been together for almost 14 years. And she goes, I've seen you at 197 and all the way up to 245 pounds. And I've seen an incredibly ripped version and unhealthy fat version in every weight class. That's right. That. And so the, and the reason why I bring that up is because many times I'll get people that just want to like my, my cousins who just want to lose about 30 pounds or so. And it's like, 30 pounds means nothing. The scale weight means nothing. Like I could literally keep your weight exactly the way it is and and build you the most banging body you've ever seen in your life with your exact weight. And I think there's a misunderstanding around that, that you, you need to see the scale go down. And I was trying to communicate that to my cousin that actually when we first start this process and I want you lifting and I want to feed your body more, I actually don't want to see the scale move much at all because that's not the problem here. The problem is not that you're 40 pounds mm. overweight on the scale. It's that we have a lot of extra body fat and you, you're you under muscled. And if I do a really good job of building muscle, we'll simultaneously start to shed some of the body fat and you might not see the scale move very mm. much at all. But fast forward three months of trusting this process with me and I'll show you a radically different body, but no movement on the scale. That's really hard for people to wrap their brain around, especially if you have got a number in your head that you think this is where you look good or you can, felt you can, good at. You can look it up online. You could go up online and look up a 140 pound woman at 20% body fat versus a 140 pound woman at 30% body fat, same height radically different. They look very different. Yep. Do the same thing for a man. Look at a man that's 10% body fat at 190 pounds uh, versus a man that's at 20% body fat at 190 pounds, same height. They will look very different. Muscle looks and feels and is very different than body fat. Body fat, if we were just to take a bunch of body fat and put it on the table and put 20 pounds of it right here and I put 20 pounds of muscle next to it, the 20 pound of muscle pile would be smaller. It takes up like maybe a quarter less space roughly, but then again- And shape different. It's very mm -hmm. different. Look, if you gain 10 pounds of body fat, most people know where it's going to go. It ain't going to the great places uh, on your body where you want it. Uh, gain 10 pounds of muscle, you know where it goes? Wherever you told it to go. Yeah. That 10 pounds of muscle is going to go to the areas that you built. So what did you work on in the gym? Uh, well, I want to build- more glutes or more quads, or I want to have a nicer looking upper back or more sculpted or shaped arms or whatever. That's where that 10 pounds go. So it's not just that muscle takes up less space. It's also that m muscle shapes and sculpts your body. And unless you're one of those genetic anomalies where you gain body fat and it all goes to your boobs or wherever, right? Uh, that's just not how body fat works. Yeah. So muscle does that from a look perspective. But then when you look at them, from a metabolic standpoint, which one, now you need to have a certain amount of body fat uh, to in order to survive, right? You don't want to go too low. I think I don't need to say this. There's an essential amount of body fat. But besides that, metabolically speaking, muscle is metabolically active. Fat in comparison is incredibly inactive. Muscle, insulin sensitive. Fat, not so much. Muscle, receptors for hormones like testosterone and growth hormone. Body fat, not so much. Muscle moves your body. Fat just sits on your body. One of them makes you mobile. One of them makes you strong. One of them makes you capable. The other one weighs you down yeah. and makes it harder for you to do things. So if your weight stayed the same, but you got lean, you're going to look and feel incredible. And the scale lies. Now, if you're going to use a scale, we've talked about this before, combine it at least with a body fat test. So if you do lose some weight or gain some weight, you can see muscle fat, Hey, here, here's what's going on. Here's not what's going on because there's on the other side of it, you could also lose weight and lose muscle yeah. and you won't be happy with the results, even though the scale says, well, and the down. truth is this is what normally happens when you run what a traditional workout was, especially for your, your average female your person that was exercising 20 years ago, it would be eat less and run. 
And that recipe is the recipe for losing, for muscle, muscle, yeah, muscle. for losing muscle as fast as you are fat. So the scale goes down by ten pounds, but you lose five pounds of muscle and five pounds of fat. Yeah, you know, I want to say, Adam, you know, for someone listening, he's like, "What are you talking about?" Like, look, this is now well studied, and I'm so glad we are in now where we're at in the space and why this is a revolution because now we finally have studies and data to support what we've observed for over two decades, which we've seen. We saw this. We saw this. When we ran gyms, we had the cardio section, yeah. right? The weight, the free weight area, the machine area, the group X classes. And then maybe if you're in a big box, you have a pool and that kind of stuff. But we would see this, right? We'd see the members that would come in and would live on cardio. And we would see them slowly become flabbier. Mm -hmm. You know, the people that just come in all the time. And they're just, and we would we saw this, but now the data supports us. Look at studies uh, of weight loss through running and calorie restriction. And here's what you find. On average, 40% of the weight that is lost comes from muscle. Some studies show more. So if you lost 10 pounds on the scale, four came from muscle, which also means now you have a slower metabolism, which also means now that you're smaller, but you don't necessarily look that much better. No. Now look at the studies on strength training and feeding your body. Fat, pure fat loss. And oftentimes you gain some muscle along with it. Well, look at the oxidative stress too. A lot of times you'll see that. It, I mean, you look tired. You look at the bags under the eyes. A lot of the features like skin wise, a lot of people don't like per se, you know, if they're just completely trying to, to solve this weight problem with cardiovascular training, not to mention, you know, if you're going down that route and you're under eating and then, and you're also just doing this repetitive movement and stress, you know, that's got a shelf. There's a shelf to that. You can't keep going in that direction without injuring yourself and having incredible joint pain. So, you know, you have to vary your training and, and strength training allows that it's built in. It's already baked in there. Whereas cardiovascular, you have to get really creative and outside the box, which it's, people don't even realize that, you know, you have to move differently. You can't just move the same way and just, this is going to be the answer to every, every time I feel like I'm a little bit overweight. The best part about this is it's actually easier. It's it and it takes of less course, doing work. things right. It's always easier. It, it's right? it, that's the crazy part about you it. You have to commit to it. It was yeah. it was one of the coolest uh, parts. Like with Katrina and I, you know, for as long as we dated, to watch that uh, transformation that she went through because you know we dated for years uh, without me ever telling her how to lift weights or train or anything. Like I didn't I didn't bother until she asked me. And then when she asked me, I completely flipped it on its head and it was like eliminated all the running, had her increase her calories, mm -hmm. hit her protein intake and strength train, lift heavy ass weight three times a week. That was it. And I remember her just being like, this can't possibly be enough. And then watching what happened six months later, her going, holy shit, I'm eating more food than I've ever ate in my life. My body looks different than it's ever looked. It's easier for me. to. I've seen abs for the first time in my life. Like, it blew her mind how much easier it was. And then since then, so much easier to maintain because now she actually has a metabolism, which gives her more flexibility around her diet. It used to be she'd be on a strict diet and running like crazy to be in what she would consider back then good shape. And then she'd fall off and it would be like, oh, she'd introduce some drinking or pizza or something in the diet and inconsistent with her running. And she put on this body fat and then she'd go back to this vicious cycle. It's like where now she has this ability when you've built a lot of muscle you get more metabolic flexibility. You could actually have some of these things in the diet and it not feel like it sticks you to know, you right away. You know what's interesting too about this, uh, not to go too veer too far off, the hormone balancing effects of strength training also influence how you store body fat. A lot of people don't realize this, but if you strength train properly and fuel your body appropriately, what your body does through the muscle building process or the strength building process is it organizes its hormones because your hormones are the signalers, right? So it, it takes your hormones and says, okay, we're getting this signal to get stronger. We're getting adequate nutrients and protein and rest. Let's get stronger. But first, we need to organize our hormones to do so. So it upregulates what are called androgen receptors. Androgen receptors are what testosterone is attached to. Very important for women as well. It, it boosts growth hormone, improves insulin sensitivity. Cortisol becomes appropriate where it's high in the morning and starts to come down at night so you could sleep estrogen and progesterone start to balance out. And that hormone profile is what builds strength, builds muscle, and leads to those results. But that hormone profile also leads to healthy fat storage. What do I mean by that? Well, you'll notice, uh, and, you've been, and maybe people are aware of this, but high cortisol throughout the day, imbalances in estrogen and progesterone, low testosterone, growth hormone that's out of whack, insulin insensitivity, it promotes fat storage around the midsection 
in mm-hmm. women. And it takes away fat storage around the glutes and the hips. You actually get more of an unhealthy type of body fat storage. In men, by the way, you, it increases visceral body fat, that hard body fat that's around the organs. So the, even the kind of fat that you have on your body is healthier when you organize your hormones in a healthy way, which strength training is the best way to do it. Now, I'm, I'm going to be honest, getting healthier will always typically make your hormone profile look better. But strength training really directly sends that signal that says, we need a hormone profile that builds muscle, which also mirrors the hormone profile you probably had in your late teens, mm-hmm. early 20s, that hormone profile that people- When you're growing and building. To, yeah, that te- people tend uh, to search for. So, uh, you know, it's the difference between skinny and thin or strong and sculpted, right? It's the difference between I'm restricting myself to I'm fueling myself. It's a very different approach. And that's also why it takes so much less work because the value of the workout is not how many calories I'm burning in this workout. The value of the workout is, am I sending the signal to my body in the right way appropriately for my body so that it can start to do the work during the recovery and rest process? This is why less exercise than appropriately is more effective than more exercise than inappropriately. And in this case, that's exactly what you're doing when you strength train properly and feed yourself properly. Do you guys see a lot of women who come to you after getting off birth control? Oh, and yeah. that, because I, I, I mean, obviously birth control is hormones. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine if you take them, it obviously will change your hormone profile. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when, when women get off, do they oftentimes have a tough time getting their bodies to re-regulate? They do. They do. So, so oftentimes a lot of women come to us wanting to get off birth control, right? So that's when I'm like, okay, we really need to support all the areas of your body so we can make your body feel as safe as possible Mm. and to support your body so you can feel better coming off of it. Right. But it takes time. It takes time because once, you know, that brain to ovary connection, you're not ovulating on birth, you know, on, on most birth control. So when when you're not ovulating, it's going to take time for your cycle to really start to regulate again. And you can have a lot of surges of hormones depending on what other things you're going through. And if your gut health, gut health isn't in check, if your diet isn't in check, it just is a cascade event, right? So birth control is a big it's a big, big thing that we see in the practice causing issues with so, patients. So your goal is let's get you healthy, as healthy as possible. Yeah. Why you go off because so that your there, body can handle this change. Yeah, because there is a time and place too. You know, there's some patients who are dealing with extreme endometriosis, um, a lot of issues like that. And if they've exhausted all options, sometimes getting on that support can be helpful. Mm-hmm. It can just for symptoms. I am not like against all things, right? There is a time and place, but it's thrown around like candy and it's dangerous, you know, mm-hmm. especially for young kids, young this kids. It's a chemically and, induced yeah. menopause. Yes. So, so you, you put your 13 year old on it because she has acne mm-hmm. and you're, that's what you're doing with her hormones. And we do the Dutch test right? and their hormones are sh- gone. Mm-hmm. They're not showing up. How yeah. crazy is that? Like how many times we use medications off label? You know, right. birth control, yeah. prevent getting pregnant. Oh, yeah. look, it might clear up your skin. Right. Oh, look, it might change your mood. Hey, look, you might, <laughs> you know, do this other thing. Have you guys seen the studies? I brought this up a long time ago, but there's more of them now coming out. Have you seen the studies on women who meet their partners? Yes. I've on birth control? People talking about this. And a then lot. they get off birth control. And they're yeah. not attracted to them anymore. No. Yeah. I know. It's wild. <laughs> it's wild. Isn't that wild? I know. Oh, that's so good. I, I, in fact, I, I <laughs> heard this woman. Partners. Oh. <laughs> I, so I, I was, uh, there was this one article I read and this woman said that she met this guy, she was on birth control, fell in love with him, whatever, loved how much he, sm- <laughs> like what, what he smelled like, went off birth control, hated. Was not attracted smelled. to him. His smell and was not attracted to yeah. him anymore. It's wild. It's so crazy. And uh, there's studies on women on birth control, not birth control, and they'll take pictures of men, their faces, and they'll digitally masculinize the face mm-hmm. or feminize. So it's the same face more feminine version, more masculine version. And when they're on birth control, they prefer the more feminine version. When they're off of it, wow, they prefer wow. the more masculine version. So how interesting. Mm, so it's funny, you know, like so hormones drive our behaviors. Oh, it does. For sure. Is the point of the whole, yes. you know, yes. this whole thing. So, yes. so you guys, you guys must see some pretty interesting changes in people's, I guess, behaviors and personalities when they balance hormones out. That's where they, true. Where yeah. they feel different and they're acting a little they different. They tend to feel... 
better. Better. They mm-hmm. they go through a little period where they feel maybe worse sometimes oh, yeah. when they get off. And then thing, you know, mm-hmm. calm down and we work with their pathways or whatever, you know, we're doing. And then they, they feel a lot better. You really have to take it person to person depending yeah. on what their body is going through. You know, if they're under a lot of stress and they have a lot going on. I mean, if you take them off birth, if they want to come off birth control, that's their choice, mm-hmm. right, for their body. You have to be careful with that. I mean, they, they could just send them into a cascade. So I'm wanting to make their body feel as safe as possible, right? Mm. Supporting and figuring, okay, like what is going on within your body right now? How can we support and get you, you know, optimally functioning the best as you can? And then we can do that. So, uh, so with when it comes to hormones with people, and you're looking at how they drive people's behaviors, you guys talked about you mentioned PMS a couple times. What is normal PMS, and what is not normal PMS? Oh my goodness! Because yeah. I, I feel like obviously that you know you know watch TV shows and, and movies, and you know you see the caricatures and the you know right. stereotypes or whatever, and then I hear well you're not supposed to have symptoms like that. It's like what's normal? Yeah, it's so it's very normal to have. To know, first off, I always recommend women, especially to track their menstrual cycle, get to know your menstrual cycle, right? The different phases and what you're supposed to feel during them. Because you can utilize, you know, your workouts depending on the phases that you're in. You can, you're going to feel more confident in different phases. You're going to, and you can really map your cycle and know, okay, this is a normal feeling that I'm experiencing, right? So when you talk about PMS, a little bit of cramping, a little bit of moodiness before your period is completely normal. But if this is a very life-changing event for you, like- Like depilitating, yeah, I like gotta if stay you home cannot, from work or school. Yeah, there is something underlying going on. So I definitely recommend anybody listening here, talk to your doctors, definitely get to the bottom of that, but work with a functional doc that really knows hormones, mm. <laughs> really knows hormones, knows what to look for, how to support your cycle, and how to work with hormones in general, functionally, mm. right, with the testing. What are common um, issues with PMS where you're like, okay, this is something we need to look at? Heavy periods. Okay. So heavy periods, clots, really long cycles, really short cycles. Really bad pain. Oh yeah. yeah. Pain is a big one. Especially when when I see a lot of pain or pain during sex, you know, you gotta really think, okay, what else could be going on here? Am I dealing with any cysts, fibroids, endometriosis type things? So anything extreme, right? But the pain is a big one. How often is it because we've talked about gut health and I keep hearing Every time I talk to a functional medicine practitioner, I talk about how that's quite often the root cause is Mm -hmm. coming from the gut. And you guys have Mm -hmm. talked about how it can cause estrogen dominance. We're talking about PMS issues. How often would you say, I know this is on an individual basis, but generally speaking, how often are those symptoms coming from gut issues? Because the gut- Really? Yeah, that and supporting the liver, you know, really supporting, especially with estrogen and cycles. You're really looking at your progesterone estrogen ratio, right? Especially, you know, for women. And yeah, you, you got to support the gut. You got to make sure you're you're t- babying and taking care of that liver, supporting that phase one, phase two, which the Dutch test looks at. So if anybody's interested in wanting to really do a deep dive, that is the test for you because it's you're going to know, okay, what do I need to be supporting, you know, as far as nutritionally, What do I need to be supporting as far as cofactors, right, for helping a lot of that detoxification? How do I, you know, am I... Am I clearing properly, right? Mm. Am I do I have a healthy phase one? Am, am I blocked somewhere? So you it's very specific to the person, and there's so much you can do to help as you know, to metabolize your estrogen. But if you don't know, you know, you can just go out and take a bunch of supplements you hear from someone on Instagram <laughs> yeah. and you can make the problem like worse. Dim. Yes. Like Dim is a big supplement we see overused for the wrong people. And that that helps. So DIM mm-hmm. is uh, that reduce it or changes the conversion of estrogen to a less. What it does is so in. It's it's a form of it's in the cruciferous veggies, right. right? But it's a it's a larger compound when you supplement with it. You get a lar- larger doses. Yeah, of you it. have to eat a lot of broccoli. Right. To get, okay. Yeah, don't, like, don't go eat a bunch of broccoli yeah, like yeah. that. You're gonna feel like crap. Right. So what it does is it really in in phase one estrogen metabolism. We have three different phases. We have a two OH 
a 4-OH and a 16-OH. And what happens is, is we want to favor mostly that 2-OH protective pathway in that phase one estrogen metabolism. 4-OH and 16-OH is more proliferative and inflammatory. So what DIM does, yes, yeah. it's, yeah. So you, it pushes you more so out of that, those pathways, mm. favoring more of that 2-OH pathway, right? And then we got to go on to phase two. You know, once we get you favoring the healthier pathway, then we got to get you clearing that estrogen. So what does your phase two look like? What does your gut look like, right? So- yeah, you want to be careful. I was just going to say, when when would DIM be a bad idea then? Because if if you, first of all, it can really move the needle on estrogen numbers. Mm -hmm. So if estrogen is high, you might consider DIM. But if estrogen is not high, but your pathways are off, it doesn't mean that you need to take DIM. Mm -hmm. It means that you just may need some sulforaphane. So sulforaphane is really good at helping with the pathways, but not lowering the needle on estrogen. Right. And we have a gene who, that helps us metabolize estrogen. If that gene is, that enzyme is slow and you take DIM, you're going to feel bad. Mm -hmm. So you're going to start to feel, we have, you know, people who come to us on it and they feel worse. And that's yeah. because that, that it's the, the COMT gene. So if that enzyme is slow and they take DIM, they won't feel well. So they'd be a better um, person to take sulforaphane instead. So that's what we try mm -hmm. to teach. Like we get that detailed mm -hmm. in our program, like teaching people don't mm -hmm. take this. This is not right for you, but this would be better. Hey, sorry to interrupt. We have a free guide titled Understanding Your Mood, Stress, and Sleep. It tackles all of those things from a health and longevity perspective. It's a totally, totally free guide. So just click on the link at the top of the description below. For you. Well, yeah, it's like if you have... Uh, you know, you could have certain symptoms and it be too much of a nutrient, but it may look yep. similar to having too little of that nutrient. Then you supplement with that nutrient. <laughs> I had an aunt, this actually happened to where she was having peripheral neuropathy. So she mm -hmm. was having like, like tingling in her, in her, in her extremities. And she had read online that it could be a deficiency of B vitamins. So she was supplementing a tremendous amount of B vitamins and it kept getting worse, kept getting worse. Well, eventually she went and saw a functional medicine practitioner it was too much B vitamins. Oh, yeah. yeah that's what B6. Was that's what was causing the issue. Oh. Yeah. And so she's like, oh, it's these <laughs> pills that I'm taking with all yeah. these all B6 these vitamins. will really give you a lot of numbness and tingling Long if you take too much. Higher yeah. doses, yeah. Is, is DIM ever recommended to men then also? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. We look at the same thing. We mm -hmm. look at the pathways. We look at their uh, comp T gene to see how that's functioning. And um, we should their gut health and yeah, their gut health mm -hmm. because the, the stool test will tell you about phase three of estrogen metabolism. So if you're pooping it out, so there's calcium to glucate mm -hmm. if you're if you need help there, but the other pathways are okay. So again, it's it's pretty complicated. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not an easy thing to understand, but this is why we're like. We don't want people just to start taking this stuff. Well, we want to teach them about it. What I it. like about functional medicine is, I mean, if you break, if you get into it, it is very complicated, but the solutions are not so complicated right. in the sense that, okay, your gut's off. It may be off in this direction or this direction, but the the solutions are very similar in the sense yeah. that where we can you know work with, in other words, I could have issues with my physical health and exercise can build muscle. It can burn body fat. It can burn you know more calories. But regardless of what my goals are, exercise will help all of them. Right. Is kind of the, the you know the dir direction I'm going. Yeah. You've talked about supporting the liver. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? And is this based off of liver enzymes being off or or no. not? That's a that's uh, a sign that this is a real this problem. This is a big issue. Okay, so when liver enzymes are off, we've gone too far. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So we we do this regardless, mm -hmm. and we see people just in general who have issues with detoxing. Um, I do personally, and and I've talked to you and, and Jess about this with Aurelius because sometimes you have gene mutations that that make you not detox very well. Mm -hmm. So um, there's different scenarios in which you don't use your detox pathways properly. So you want to talk about the different like ways we support it? Yeah. So we we always like to start gentle with patients. So first and foremost the liver is constantly working for us without us even having to think about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's always detoxing, always working. But again, going back to we get overburdened by all the crap that we're exposed mm -hmm. to. So whenever I'm trying to work with detox pathways, you gotta eliminate the crap. 
the crap out of the diet. That's first and foremost, sugar, industrial seed oils, inflammatory foods, like a lot, like a lot of excess processed grains, um, you know, even inflammatory dairy for some patients. Some patients tend to handle it good once they've worked on other underlying drivers if it's good sources, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so really nourishing the body with nutrient dense foods is really supportive for the liver. Get in lots of color, right? Lots of good color, fiber. Um, and then gentle castor oil packs are great. They're really helpful at stimulate, you know, stimulating the lymphatic system. How do those work? Do you just put them on? Oh yeah, yeah. you put them right, right over so the I liver. Had just I know. So guys. how does that work? Is it like absorbed through the skin? It does, like, it does. and okay. it works with the bile ducts. Like mm -hmm. it really helps. It's helpful for motility, for bowel movements. Because I know you could take castor oil, but that's totally different. Yeah, I will, I'm going to challenge you to take a castor oil pack and put it over your gut. What's yeah. it going to do? And you me? tell me if you poop the next day. No. Yes, you're going. It's to. not a laxative effect. It's very, very gentle. Yeah. Okay. Very, but very it, gentle. It does work. It does. Yeah, and we have we do them over the liver usually. But I just like to people who don't believe. I'm like, put it over your gut and see what <laughs> happens, and you will poop. Well, look, I've learned. I've learned now. Like at this point, where I don't. You know, if I'm talking to people that I trust and I, I see fields where people where things are being used on a regular basis consistently because there's because people see value, that there's some value there. So I used to be that guy where I'd be mm -hmm. like, Oh, that's you know, that doesn't yeah. work or whatever. Like I remember people rubbing like uh, you know, Ben Gay on their knee and I'd be like, That's so dumb. It doesn't, you know, work that way, it doesn't absorb with any but then I learned later on, well, well, the cooling feeling confuses the pain signaling and <laughs> yeah. so you feel like you have yeah. less pain. So it does work, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah, so I know better now. It so. doesn't <laughs> penetrate to the liver right, necessarily, right. but it's a, it's what it's doing like with the lymphatic system and helping move things out. It's uh, awesome. So it's more it's like very, that. very gentle. And then of course there's lots of nutrients, right? Um, I love NAC, right? They're, that's really, really yeah. good. Your B vitamins, magnesium is really important for liver health. What do you guys think of Sam E. I, 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 Sam some E. People. I, really? Some, okay. Yeah. Some, some people, people don't do really well. well. With it. Some people don't. It depends how their methylation is and yeah. their gene mutations and all that. So stuff. I take Sam E. and I feel great mm -hmm. on okay. Sam E. And uh, it's it's almost like a mild antidepressant for me, which is, I know how. So, so you could have the yeah. MTHFR gene mutation. Yeah, so I'm going to see that because you did your test. Didn't you? I did. I did the, the <laughs> test that you asked us to do. Yeah. Did you do a Dutch test? No, he did the genetic I'd be interested to see your comp gene, like your phase two, if you feel feel really good on Sammy. Okay. All yeah. Right, all right. It makes me, gives me a little bit of energy. So I yeah. can, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. We'll see. We'll dissect it. Run oh, it. Great. We'll dissect it. For you. <laughs> <laughs> great. I love, I mean, look, I love this stuff because, um, just as a trainer and I don't deal with nearly as complicated. I never dealt with nearly as complicated as, as, uh, and as deep as the stuff that you guys work with, but just through exercise I know, uh, and just through basic diet. Like I understood diet from uh, calories, macronutrients, and then how at, at one point I got somewhat educated because I did work with a functional medicine practitioner who was a friend of mine. I, I could identify things like food intolerances. Um, and then I understood, you know, SIBO and all that stuff later on, but I never tested. I never understood how to do that stuff. But I could see such a huge individual variance from person to person, which is exercise, yeah. which is very basic in comparison. So what you guys are dealing with, I mean, the the individual variance could be so wide. Mm -hmm. So and you're saying so when people fill out this this quiz at home, that's gonna help direct them to figure out their own individual needs so they yeah, can figure it out look. for themselves. Where yeah, to look. Where to look. Where to look yeah. for themselves. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah we're excited. excited. Like the basics for everybody. Mm -hmm. We teach you how to, all the ways to gently detox. Mm -hmm. We go through all of it, like really detailed. Mm -hmm. We tell you exactly what to eat based on your situation. We talk about stress. We talk about trauma, like all the things you can possibly do. And then if you're doing all these things and you still need more, we walk you through the testing. Mm. How do you guys feel about a popular supplements in my space like creatine i mean when, when i first got started creatine was like this oh it's a great muscle builder now there's all these great st studies on improving cognitive health and you know heart it's health making and, a big comeback yeah it so is, yeah. Uh, is there any like anybody who shouldn't be supplementing with it or do you just guys monitor your kidney health that's okay. my yeah. biggest thing okay. i don't yeah. see a lot of issues with it but okay. if i know someone especially a lot of athletes and stuff that i take care of if I know someone supplementing with, I'm just keeping an eye on things. Yeah. You yeah. just got to. Now, what about protein intake? You guys both talked about animal, you know, mm -hmm. good sources of animal protein. And I know gram per gram yeah. mm -hmm. in the athletic performance studies. So these are studies based off of muscle and athletic performance. Okay. That's all they're looking at. That animal sources of protein on a gram per gram basis are just more effective. In other words, you have to eat a lot more plant protein 
to get the same benefit effects, I should say, and athletic right. performance as animal protein. Are you guys pro high protein diet for the Absolutely. most part? Absolutely. Okay. Hundred yeah. percent. Now, why is that? What do you guys see from that? Just overall, like the amino acids for mental health alone, supportive for perimenopause, going into menopause. I mean, because we're more insulin resistant. So that's so important. And it's just it, for blood sugar. I mean, blood so sugar, many huge. things, your hormones. Yeah. It, it, protein is so essential for the body. And I will tell you, when we start with patients who are not eating protein and then they switch, it is a night and day difference yeah. Yeah. in their symptoms and how they feel. Yeah, I see that. I mean, I saw that with working with clients uh, all the time. Yeah. Now, would you guys, so we, uh, we in our space, advocate for pretty high, like yep. 0.6 to 1 gram per pound of body yeah, weight. Are you guys doing the same thing? Yep. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's phenomenal. We find, do you find it's hard with people who you talk to too, hard for them to reach? that oh it's so it, it it's creates difficult. so much oh yeah, if, yeah. look if, i'll tell you what if i want someone to lose weight and i used to tell people count your calories count your macros the whole thing then i realized just it, here eat you hit your protein targets eat your protein first avoid heavily processed foods everybody lost weight i know yeah. just those just those things it's right wild. there i know, you know and you the, feel so much better too. so I, I would love to ask you guys what you guys think about this because for a long time what kind has been implied is that were these humans or these eating machines? We evolved uh, during times of scarcity. So if you just put food in front of us, we're just going to eat until we're super obese and then we kill ourselves. But what seems to be more true is that our bodies naturally regulate themselves to not be underweight and to also not be overweight. But what's important is that we eat foods that we evolved with because if we eat heavily processed foods, then the obesity becomes, that, that kind of is the default. Because when I have people eat, whole natural foods, high protein, which is what we probably ate for most of human history. Um, they, and I tell them, eat as much as you want. Yeah. They end up with a it's so good, true. normal body body like, weight. Do you guys, and the do you, calories stay within the range mm -hmm. because they're satiated. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's, it's not this constantly trying to feel satisfied with all this garbage. It's a totally different story when you eat whole foods you feel full yeah, yeah. within a, a a good size portion. You don't need to overeat to feel something. How much does that affect the, the just the microbiome itself? Because I know the microbiome changes with what you eat. How much does just eating whole natural foods affect the microbiome? Oh, it's so important at feeding bacteria, helping it replicate and grow. I mean, for insulin, for blood sugar, so many things. I mean, it's, and inflammation. Yeah, I mean, yeah. absolutely. Okay. What are some reasons that people? Um, cause I, I know what I do when someone can't lose weight and they're and they're tired and I know what to look at, but I've had, it, this isn't super common, but I've had times where it was like almost unexplained. Like this isn't almost mm -hmm. kind of doesn't make sense. What places do you look when that, is it hormones? Is that the first place you no, look? No, it's the, everything, everything we've talked about. Wow. Gut is huge. Hormones are, are definitely big. big Thyroid part. is big, okay. mm -hmm. but then even mold because mm -hmm. it's so inflammatory so when we see people who are like, I've done everything and I can't lose weight and we'll check them for mold, they have it. So the way I explained it, I had this happen to me once with a client where we did everything, couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. Her calories were so low. I'm like, I don't want to go any oh, lower. Yeah. Yeah. We're trying to speed up her metabolism through my traditional you know, methods. This was, like, this was at least, I want to say, this must have been at least 15 years ago. And then she worked with the functional medicine practitioner that I at the time was friends with. And they um, worked with and helped uh, heal her gut. Mm -hmm. And then the weight came off. Oh, yeah. And the way that it was explained to me was when the body is under a lot of stress, one of its protective mechanisms is to store body fat. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. uh, for most of human history, one of the number one stressors was not finding enough food. Yes. So your body's like, hold on to body fat and don't build muscle because that burns too many calories. Right. Is that accurate? Would you say it's accurate? hundred okay. percent. And that's, and that's what I go back to is when someone comes to me and they're like, I'm doing everything right. Like I'm eating clean, I'm exercising, I'm not losing weight. I'm like, okay, we need to make your body feel as safe as possible because that's what's happening, especially mm. with, we see it all the time with perimenopause shifting into menopause where we have all these hormonal dysregulations, right? Going on because your body's fluctuating and, and transitioning. So when I see though that, that weight 
loss resistance, you have to make the body feel as safe as possible because it is. It's going to say, there's no way I'm going to let you lose any weight right now. I'm going to hold on to anything to make me feel safe and keep me safe. So it's something that I see often. It must be a pleasant surprise for you guys to see patients who come in for you know, fatigue, skin issues, my hair's falling out, all these health issues. Then they work with you and they're like, oh, I lost weight. Yeah. I know. Is that like common? It's oh, very, very common. Yeah. Very. It, take, it can take time for some patients, especially hormones take time. They yeah. do. You know, so if it's hormone related, you just give it time, stay the course, right? Do all the things. Stress is a big one. I mean, we got to get a hold of stress. And I know that's, we get the big eye roll with yeah, that, right? Because it's hard. It's so hard. We're stressed. Everybody's stressed. Mm -hmm. So you really do have to put the proper tools in place to help your body. Because if mm -hmm. not, it's it's just, it's a, it's a big thing that we see drive a lot of things in the practice. So this at-home, functional medicine at-home course that you guys created, this is out now, right? As yeah. We're going to drop this episode. It'll be out. Has it been out? Or is it going to be out? With this episode. It's coming out with the episode. It's coming out with the episode. <laughs> whoop, whoop. And this the goal is, is in, in, again, this is why I was excited to have you on, because I think this is the first I've ever heard of anything like this, is you get this and it helps you direct yourself yes. as mm -hmm. to where to look. And then from there, if they want to go deeper, they can go deeper. There's more modules they can purchase. Right. And then those extra modules, uh, Becky, you were telling me, you can help people read, like do labs and then help them kind of read can their own order lab. the lab. You or can, yourself. You order the lab from the from us, right. basically. And then we teach you how to interpret that lab. Wow. And then what do you do based on that interpretation? Wow. wow. So. so you guys must be amazing moms with your kids then when they're sick and stuff. You kind of know where to look. I and do my best. You know how kids off. are. <laughs> you guys were cracking us up on the other episode talking about your kids. Yeah. We go through the same thing. Yeah. You know, my son's like, if I hear gut mom one more <laughs> time, you know. Are you, are you, when you take your kids to the doctor and if for like, well, first off, you we probably, don't. I was going to say, you probably, probably don't, don't unless it's like yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Right, exactly. How often have your kids had to be on antibiotics? They've never, never been. What? No. Never? How well, no. Jake, my oldest, was once for pneumonia. When in that case, it's an emergency. Right. He was in the hospital Absolutely. with 106 degree fever. Yeah. Pneumonia, Time and place. Which I right? diagnosed because they couldn't <laughs> at the ER. So. Oh my gosh. Yeah. How old are your kids? Uh, Jake is 13. Uh, Levi is 10 and, and Liam is eight. In one time antibiotics. That's it. Wow. And you never? Never. Mm -mm. And yours 12 and... 12 and 9. Wow. I know. Antibiotics are super over. I mean, it's better now, but you know, when I was a kid. Yeah. They're I, super I mean, when we were kids. Oh, I got them all the time for ear infections. Left and right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm like, gee, I wonder why I had gut issues. I know. That's yeah, what I'm saying. Exactly. Hammered me. And, and a lot of times, this is really good for anyone listening. If you're having issues with your kids, right? And your kid was given antibiotics at birth, which happens all the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Or the mother was given antibiotics because, you know, sometimes they give them to you towards the end. It depends on what's going on. Yeah. Or they, what is that bacteria that they'll find when they do like, they'll, they'll do like evangelical culture and they'll say, oh, you got to put you on these antibiotics. Because strep B. Yeah, strep B. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. So that, exactly. So, and your kids having reactions to foods, like food sensitivities, it's the it's the gut. Yeah. It's those food sensitivities are almost always caused by gut issues. Mm -hmm. So we won't run a food sensitivity test until we've treated the gut. Because if we run it first, they're going to show all these foods they're supposedly sensitive to. But that'll change after they fix it the gut. It changes the change, time. You fix the gut. And then a lot of the time, it wasn't really just that food. It was just they had leaky gut usually. And, and then that's just causing an inflammatory response to most So that things. happened to me. So when my gut was really bad, and I've told you guys, I know I've told you the story. Yeah. I think. When my gut was really bad and I eventually had to figure it out, I was sensitive to peanuts egg whites, uh, all dairy in any form, even dairy fat. Wow. Um, uh, gluten, I was so hypersensitive that if I had two breadcrumbs on something, like yeah. that was it. Um, broccoli was like one, I think there was, a, I think that was it. And eventually after healing my gut, I could have everything except for dairy proteins. Um, dairy proteins still bother me, but I could do dairy fat. I could do butter all day long. Mm -hmm. Doesn't bother. So it totally changed yeah. my, my food sensitivities. And I'll run it if we feel like we need to move the needle a little bit more. You know, if I'm still seeing issues with digestion, mm -hmm. even after really diving in in the gut, there's a time and place for yeah. it. Yeah. Right. It's usually after working on the gut. Yeah. Well, yeah. And then nowadays uh, with like SIBO, which is uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, if you're positive for that, the the treatment used to have to be antibiotics, but now mm -hmm. you can do herbal antimicrobial. antimicrobials. Yeah. And there was this like landmark study that came out, uh, I don't want to say th four years ago maybe, 
that compared the antimicrobials, the natural ones, to the antibiotics, they were just as effective. Yeah, yeah. and sometimes the Better. antibiotics are less, and you have to do uh, rifaximin and neomycin, and you have to do multiple rounds, and insurance usually doesn't cover it, so it's thousands of dollars. Thousands. It's so And it's expensive. it's crazy, and if you, you can just do it antimicrobial supplement format, and that will usually get rid of it. When someone takes antibiotics, should they take uh, probiotics, Mm-hmm. During yes. the same time? Yeah, just not within like an hour or two. Of yeah. it. Okay, yeah. and that helps offset some of yeah. the negative effects. And then once they finish, of course, keep going. Yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. even up it maybe a little bit. Awesome. And check your gut. And I don't, I don't think this is just to women. I think men and women get a lot of value for this. Is just to focus on getting stronger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're, we're marketed to so much, both men and women, women especially. That th- this look, you know, it's right. all about this look. It's all about this look. And when that drives your behaviors around nutrition and exercise, for most people, it drives them in the wrong direction. That's right, yeah. And so I love sending any of my clients in this direction of like, listen, we are just going to focus on getting strong because that in itself is difficult. It's mm-hmm. difficult enough to program correctly, get adequate rest, feed the body nutritionally so it has the tools and the, the building blocks to go build muscle and build strength. And yet you're not focusing on the scale and getting all weary about worried about what the what the mirror show. It's like I'm just my goal is to get strong. I love that. Yeah. I love that it's more popular now. I know back uh, back when I was training clients, it was less of a thing, and it was always my favorite uh, time to to introduce the lower rep um, count and, and and do like three to five reps and and really show them like if you are focused on just getting strong. And being able to like add a bit more load, it's a completely different mindset, but also too, it's just like, it was so empowering. And, and I got the same response from basically every like female client I had was this, just like what it did for them. This was my go-to uh, for female clients towards the back half of my career. And it was so effective. And, and a lot of it has to do with just how women are marketed to in the health and fitness space. It's all about losing weight, getting lean, maybe sculpting. Nobody talks about the benefits of strength or what that translates into. So women typically, if you ask them, why do you work out? They'll, you know, they'll say, you know, I want to look better. I want to be more fit. You know, maybe I want to get stronger, but they're not really chasing strength. When you chase strength, then they start to get all those other things that they had wanted. And, and the reason why strength is such a great pursuit is because it's hard to do a lot of things wrong and get stronger. So in other words, Mm-hmm. If you're not eating properly, you're probably not going to get stronger. If your sleep isn't that great, you're probably not going to get stronger. If your stress levels are too much or you can't manage the stress that you have, you're probably not going to get stronger. If your training program is off, you're not going to get stronger. It's a wonderful pursuit to chase because if you're consistently getting stronger, you're doing a lot of things right. Now, you don't have to necessarily be perfect. But you can lose weight and do a lot of things wrong. And of course, the weight that you lose on the scale is you know half muscle, half body fat, or sometimes mostly muscle. You can look in the mirror, which is a subjective thing, see yourself getting smaller and be happy because the scale's going down. You can ignore energy. You can ignore health because clothes are fitting looser. But if you're getting, if you're not getting stronger, then then that's it. Bottom line, you have to fix something. And if you are getting stronger, you're probably doing everything right. And, and the other side of it was it took my female clients away from the subjective aspect of looking at themselves in the mirror, judging how they look. Like, yep. it was, we're just going to get stronger for three months. We're not going to focus on anything else. And that was very freeing for them because they stopped. And then what was cool about it was within the three-month period. They got what they wanted. They're like, oh, my That's, God, I look amazing. Mm-hmm. That was the part for me that I think really – change the way I started then became like a thing that I like oh I didn't care what your goal was I was recommending we go this direction and that was also when I started to adopt this idea of like hey even though you want to lose 30 or 40 pounds I'm not going to restrict I'm going to add to your diet first all that was all part of like the same transition for me and so helping uh you know helping my female clients focus on that even though they came to me and said oh Adam I want a smaller waist and I want a butt I want all these things even though that was what they came to me originally for getting them convinced to follow this let's get stronger protocol and do these big lifts and focus on kind of a power lifting type of routine, they ended up getting the results that they ultimately yeah. wanted. And they got it by eating more foods than they thought they ever were going to. It was yeah. like such a Great such a game changer to get things. people to connect these dots and, and very empowering too. So Super. not just 
great that you hit your your physical goals or your weight, you know, body fat loss goal, but to see how empowered my clients felt after they went through that process. Yeah, you know, a, a good um, kind of way to understand this is even if I had a female client that said she wanted to build some muscle, usually it was in the butt, right? So usually they would say, if they wanted to build, it was typically the butt area. Like I want to get a bigger butt, I want to build it. If you follow that up with, well, how strong do you want to get? They always kind of confuse and say, well, I, don't, I mean, I don't really care if I get too strong. I just want to build my butt. The right answer is I want to get as strong as possible mm -hmm. because the strength is what translates to the muscle. As you get stronger, you will build more muscle. It's just a fact. There's no better predictor of muscle growth than strength. Nothing. Uh, now, of course, eventually that starts to slow down, but we're talking five years down the line. And that's by that point, you're pretty advanced. You've been very consistent for a long time. Otherwise, like if you want to build muscle, just chase strength. If you chase gaining muscle, then you're going to be playing this weird game of trying to figure out if I'm gaining muscle or is it, you know, water weight or what's going on. It was just, and, it, and again, it was just, it was objective. You either added five pounds to the bar or you didn't. This is why I, when I, back in the day, when I first started writing kind of the blueprints of the first maps program, I borrowed a lot from the strength training um, com competitive strength training side of resistance training because they had the best workouts, bodybuilding workouts, fat loss workouts. They were all, there wasn't really any science involved in their programming, powerlifting, Olympic lifting, anything where you had to actually objective, objectively perform. The coaches designed the best workouts because you hit the stage you either lift the weight or you don't. It either worked or it didn't work. And so they have the best programming as well. Well, you're highlighting one of the things that got me so excited about talking to you before we ever really met in person about Maps Anabolic when you sent it over to me. At that time in my career, I had figured this out for my female clients, and it was something that I was already implementing in their programming. And when I looked at Maps Anabolic, the thing that Maps Anabolic has in, in common with power lift or power lifting in general is, and I think it's this is the number one factor of why this is this is so uh, beneficial for women to follow a powerlifting routine, is it focuses on the three big lifts. Yeah, and we had just came out of a decade or two of most people, both men and women, neglecting those lifts, and definitely women. I did not have women squatting and deadlifting, overhead pressing, bench pressing, heavy weight. That was no. not common. It still isn't common in the gym today. And so I remember when I saw you sent over, and that's the cornerstone of Maps Anabolic is centered around those incredible lifts because we know it builds the most muscle. It does. Yeah, that's one of the that's the number one reason why powerlifting um, is a great way to train is the three <clears throat> exercises or the three movements that are done in powerlifting competitions are three of the best strength training exercises you could possibly do: the bench press, the deadlift and the squat. All three of them hit major muscle mass in the entire body. All three of them, if you get stronger, you don't just develop one muscle or two muscles. You develop entire swaths of the body, okay? And in order to get stronger at those three exercises, because you might think if you're not experienced or you're, you're not familiar with powerlifting, you think, well, that's all I do is those three exercises. No, no, no. Competition is trying to lift in those three exercises the most weight, but to train for those three, there are other exercises that support those lifts. So you do end up doing things like pull-ups or pull-downs, overhead presses. Mm. You do end up doing exercises like, you know, stiff-legged deadlifts and leg curls and stuff like that because they support those three lifts. But the goal is they pick those three, what are called gross motor movements in competition. And so if you're, for example, if somebody added 15% more weight to, let's say, their laterals, or their barbell curls, okay, or their tricep pushdown, they'll see some muscle development, not a, not a ton. You add fifteen percent more weight to a barbell squat, a deadlift, or a bench press, you're going to see a lot more results because it's such a big movement. They're just the three best exercises. We like to call we like to talk about the the top five. The top five would also include, let's say, an overhead press and mm -hmm. maybe something that includes some kind of rotation or a row. But these are the top three right They're here. They're all multi-joint lifts. Yeah. And the, the <coughs> greatest gain is like how much you you can tap into muscle recruitment and to increase the amount of force output. And so you're actually able to recruit uh, more muscle fibers throughout your entire body with, with these lifts uh, in comparison to a lot of single joint exercises. So it's it's literally the difference 
between just one musical instrument versus an entire symphony. And it's, it's, I just look at it that way because we keep talking about it as like the loudest signal and it's literally the loudest output you can produce in terms of like the exercise spectrum. And so this is why we, we always tend to program these specific lifts and different variations in all of our programming. Yeah. It's so along those lines, <clears throat> if a muscle has, is made up of muscle fibers, and one of the things that uh, will dictate, I guess, how well the muscle gets developed is, are you able to recruit all of the muscle fibers in that muscle? And the heavier a weight is, the more intense it is, the more likely you are to recruit more muscle fibers. Now, those muscle fibers are controlled and communicated to by the central nervous system. The central nervous system ultimately decides how many muscle fibers are going to be activated. Okay, so here's the kicker. An individual muscle will activate more muscle fibers when other muscles are also activated. This is how the body works. So if you were to squeeze something as hard as you could with your right hand, and, but keep the rest of your body relaxed, you would generate less force than if you squeezed with your whole body while squeezing your hand. Even though your hand is being measured, you would see a noticeable increase in the amount of power output because the central nervous system fires harder when the whole body is turned on. So what does this have to do with those exercises? Those exercises activate the entire body. So yes, a barbell squat is a leg exercise, but unlike a leg press where the rest of my body is kind of chilling and I'm just moving my legs or especially like a leg extension, I have to hold and support the bar on my back. I have to tense up my upper back, my core, stay stable. My feet and ankle have to be activated. And when I'm pushing heavy weight, all my muscles have to turn on, even though the prime movers are my lower body. So what does that mean? It's going to develop my legs more than if I didn't turn on all those other muscles. This is even more important for beginners and intermediate lifters. Now, when you're super advanced, you start to develop the ability to activate lots of muscle fibers without having to turn everything else on. This is why advanced lifters can do isolation exercises yeah. and get pretty good results. But if you've been working out for less than a couple of years, you're not going to activate all those muscle fibers unless you start to unless you turn on the other muscles. And this is why gross motor movements are so effective. That's why these these three exercises in powerlifting are so effective. Well, it's crazy. It's the benefit is it increases that capacity <clears throat> now for your other exercises, your single right. joint exercises. So it's like you squeeze more out of those once you learn, you teach the body how to do that with uh, with the overall, you know, multi-joint exercises. You could go back to your regular kind of lifting and, and realize like how much stronger you can, you can uh, get at that. Totally. I also like training for powerlifting. We said this earlier because the goal is objective. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges with fitness, and this is what I communicate to personal trainers all the time, is that the client is typically um, focused on subjective goals. Now, why are subjective goals or, or let's say landmarks in their training, why is that so frustrating? It's subjective. If you've ever met somebody who thinks that they're too fat, but you look at them and you say, you're not fat at all, or maybe you did this to yourself. If you've ever looked at a picture of yourself from 10 years ago and you're like, oh my God, I looked amazing. And then you realize, oh my God, I thought I looked terrible back then. I looked so good, right? Um, it's because your subjective view of yourself is highly influenced by your confidence, your state of mind, whether or not you're on social media all the time, who you're comparing yourself to, mm -hmm. the partner you're with, your whatever. Yeah. It's so subjective that your subjective opinion can change even though your objective body doesn't change at all. That makes fitness something that is super ineffective. This is why people will overtrain, over diet, hurt themselves, train in ineffective ways, ignore the fact that they feel like garbage. We talk to people all the time on the show when they're ignoring all these signs that they're doing too much and eating too little. It's because they're just focused on subjective goals, which again are in the, in your mind, right? Strength is objective. You got, did you get stronger? Then you're doing the right thing. Oh, you didn't get stronger. We're doing something wrong. It's black or white. Doesn't matter what you think you see in the mirror, or whatever. You can't imagine the weight to be heavier. It's either heavier or not. And so it tends to point you in the right direction. And I love that about powerlifting because when I would get clients, I could put them on this objective path and not have to have all these conversations around their subjective, uh, you know, opinion of themselves, which was very challenging Dude, to do. Subjective goals are extremely difficult for a super advanced, knowledgeable person to gauge. I, I share this all the time about my journey of competing and how difficult it was 
to be able to make sure like, wait a second, I, I swear I look like I'm putting weight on or oh, it's not, I'm not losing, it's not moving. And I'm like measuring, tracking, weighing everything. So just a map, because I'm looking at the mirror, I'm looking at the mirror or I'm looking at the scale, which both those things are subjective. <clears throat> yeah. The scale can stay the same, go up, go down. And it does, it can mean the opposite of what you think it is. So, and that's somebody who I would consider myself an advanced lifter who's very knowledgeable around the subject. So you had to go back to your numbers. I, I mean, I remember you talking to me about this where you'd look in the mirror, you'd be like, I don't, oh, I look different. But then you go back to what I ate, what I drink. And you were so meticulous that you could override your subjective opinion. Yes. You're like, no, 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 this, this, these are numbers. I must be holding water or less water or whatever. That, yeah. The, and the, and the I st even though I, I saw that I'd go like, what the, what the conversation would go like this would be like, okay, I, I need to adjust though. I'm looking, it's, this is not looking right, but I'm everything I'm doing. I know I've written it down and I've tracked it. This is right. Okay. Let me give it three to four days and let's see what happens. Yeah. And so I would be patient, stay the course. And then in three to four days, I'd see my, the mirror change or the scale would change. And there would be enough to be like, okay, I'm all right. Stay on the course. But my point is that you're talking about somebody who's really advanced and yet still is a mind fuck for me. So having a client that, that you have focus on something that is as, as clear as it can get, just telling them, okay, did we get stronger or not right. as your North star is the simplest way to keep them. And you, you brought it up as we opened up and started this. I mean, good luck getting stronger, having uh, you know poor sleep and uh, not eating enough calories or hitting protein intake. Like if you consistently miss those marks, you're not, not going to get stronger. No. You're going you're to feel it seen in the gym. So constantly trying to tweak all those things in order to get stronger really puts you in the right path of getting to whatever your goal is. Even if you have a subjective goal, like I want to look cute in this bikini, like still focusing on getting strong is the better path to get you there long-term because ultimately we know if you get stronger, you build muscle. If you build muscle, you speed up the metabolism. If you speed up the metabolism, it makes it that much easier to slim down and That's lose right. your body fat. You mentioned nutrition. <clears throat> one of the One of the biggest challenges with uh, with women for me when I used to train women was getting them to eat enough to support and fuel the type of things that we were working for in the gym. They were constantly trying to eat less, mm -hmm. constantly careful with how much they were intaking because their goal oftentimes was fat loss. But what would happen is they would go too low. It would make it very hard for us to accomplish what we were trying to accomplish. And we didn't get the metabolism boosting. We didn't get the muscle building. We didn't get the sculpting. And so it's kind of this, this kind of battle. Well, Training for strength encourages eating in a surplus. It encourages eating enough protein. In fact, it's so effective at doing this. I learned this from a therapist. I, uh, two, I used to train this couple and I trained them for a while. Then they brought me their daughter who was a recovering anorexic. And before I trained her, I remember I called the parents and I said, okay, I'll train her, but I'd like to talk to the therapist first because I want to know what I can and can't talk about. And I want to make sure I don't, you know, I, I help your daughter and don't put her in the wrong direction. The therapist told me, don't talk about body weight. Don't talk about body fat percentage. Don't talk about any of that stuff. Just focus on performance. And a light bulb went off. Of course, mm -hmm. if we just focus on getting stronger, I'm, this, that's, that's not only is it not triggering for her in terms of like, you know, restrict her eating, it's going to encourage her to eat more because if she's not getting stronger and if she wants to get stronger, which eventually I convinced her to, to want to get stronger, she knew she had to eat more and it got her to eat the right amount of protein and appropriately. That's, this is yeah. one of my favorite reasons. It's kind why, of liberating. Very liberating. It's one of my favorite reasons why this type of training is so effective. Cause especially when I'm trying to get someone to build muscle so we could get the metabolism boost and all that stuff. If somebody's afraid of gaining weight and they're constantly watching the scale, oh, mm. it's such a battle back and forth. This but it was, was such a hard one. I mean, to, 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 because that mentality of coming in and always having to be um, a certain amount of calories per day. Like the, a lot of my clients knew like, okay, if I eat a little bit more than this, you know, my body's going to change and I'm going to have this and that happen to me and to, to be able to go through and, and really trust the process that, you know, I'm going to, I'm lifting different. My mentality is different. You know, the, my body's requiring more nutrients and uh, to see them uh, go through that process and see it actually change them for the better. And like how liberating that was for them. It was fantastic. Cause now, you know, we're not worried about the scale on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. Like we're just focused on one objective and that's just to get strong. And, and then all the benefits uh, you receive and it reveals itself.
yourself, uh, yep. you know, through that process. This is why I don't like the law of thermodynamics type of conversation that so many fitness professionals have about, oh, you just got to eat less and move more. Because one of the things that I experienced in my career was starting to break down these diets and look at, you know, because the first thing I'd have yeah. them do is just show me where you're at. And okay, these people were struggling, not only these people struggling with weight loss, but they were malnutrition. Like they weren't getting enough of these nutrients. We were, we were not getting enough fiber. We weren't getting enough protein. We weren't getting enough healthy fats. Like we're, we're missing on all these things that your body wants and needs. And so for me, that, that was the first kind of light bulb that went off. Okay. Here I'm switching my clients over to getting stronger. Oh, look, they're missing all these, you know, macro and micronutrients. Let's start thinking of ways to just to add to the diet. Let's add to the diet and let's, and then let's, the way we measure if we're on the right track is performance in the gym. Let's not worry about the scales, ups and downs, stuff like that. Let's, let's speak to health and being stronger and sleeping better and more energy. And so the conversation started to shift in that direction. And then as I would add things in the diet, that would be the feedback I wanted from my clients to see, are we heading down the right path? And ultimately, what was so great about this was if you did this correctly, they're slowly building muscle and it's getting more and more difficult for them to eat more food. And naturally, they would start to lean out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's amazing how, how effective this is for coaches and trainers to focus on this aspect versus what you think you're supposed to do, cut. which is… Yeah. Cut calories, cut, yeah. cut, cut. It just because naturally makes you want to. Yeah, this person's it. 40, 50 pounds yeah. overweight. That sounds like I understand if you're or like a new coach right now listening to this, it has yeah. to be like, what? You mean to tell me you get someone who wants to lose 40, 50 pounds and you're telling me I should put them on a powerlifting routine and mm -hmm. add things to their diet? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. that sounds so counterintuitive, but it, it's it's so the right strategy for long-term success for this. Client. It is. You're building the engine uh, so they could bur look, uh, uh, by the way, there's, there's obviously more to this than just eating in a surplus. I'm not encouraging my clients to go eat junk food and garbage to do this. We're aiming for protein. I'm aiming for whole natural foods and I'm telling them to eat more. I'm adding to the diet. Now what happens when this person who normally eats fast food at this time of day, I tell them to eat, no, I want you to eat, you know, eight ounces of, of steak. I want you to eat a couple of rice, whatever. They're not going to eat both. They tend to eat what I tell them to eat. It's very satiating. Yeah. They're getting the protein that they need. Um, then they go to the gym and it fuels their performance. Yeah. So it, it's much more complicated than just that encourages eating in a surplus, but it definitely discourages eating too little or not getting enough nutrients. If you're not eating enough, you're not going to get stronger. Yeah. And if this is you You'll and you're feel scared. Weak. Yeah. And if you're scared, if you're constantly scared, oh, I, know they, I know they say to build muscle and, and I know that's, I'm supposed to do that, but I'm really scared. Don't weigh yourself. Just try and get stronger. It's it'll all, it'll it, push you in that direction. It's also a really important for coaches and trainers, psychological hurdle you help your client get over. Totally. Most of these clients that they have yo-yo dieted and extreme dieted their whole life, and you kind of flipping it on its head and saying, we're going to add things into this diet. I'm not going to focus on cutting from you and restricting from you. I'm going to focus right. on putting these in the diet. It really helps them with that mental hurdle because I don't know about you guys, but <clears throat> many of my clients that were suffering and they had this super slow metabolism is because they were scared to death to ever eat anything because That's every right. time they did, it felt to them like they just piled it all on. And so over time, they'd go on these binges and then they'd see it go on and then they'd go these hardcore restricts for long periods of time. And so then you have to, and if they're going to, if they're going to have long-term success, you've got to help them break through that mentally. And one of the best ways is right out the gates, teaching them, we're going to get strong. We're going to add things to the diet. And that's a huge, huge part of their long-term success. Right. Now, the, the next point, uh, this is just uh, one of the side effects of getting stronger, is it speeds up your metabolism. You know, burning calories manually is hard. It's first off, it's obvious work. Like if I want to burn more calories by moving, well, I got to move a lot. Well, that could be hard to do. It could be inconvenient. I got to schedule time to do that. And moving more, my body eventually learns how to adapt and burn less calories in other ways, either by paring muscle down, reducing activity in other ways, so that my calorie burn start goes back to where it was. This has been proven in study after study. Trying to burn calories manually for fat loss, there's nothing wrong with moving more. Moving more is good for you. But doing it to try to lose weight, it's a losing strategy. Every study done it has been sh it shows this. I've experienced this with clients myself. A much more effective strategy is to get your metabolism to burn more calories on its own. How do you do that? Well, you build muscle. That's it. You, you, what you're doing is you're literally building the machinery that burns a lot of calories. 
you know, the beauty of this, by the way, for somebody who's listening right now, who's like, oh God, I got to put size on my body. I'm trying to get smaller. Muscle is very dense. If you lost 10 pounds of fat, but gained 10 pounds of muscle, you'd be smaller. About a quarter of the size you would lose, almost a quarter. So it's so much, it's so dense that gaining five pounds of muscle, you're not going to look bigger. You'll feel tighter. You'll feel like much firmer, but you'd have a faster metabolism. Five pounds of muscle on your body done the right way. And I mean real muscle, not just water, glycogen, like actual contractile tissue, right? Gaining five pounds of actual real lean body mass the right way. I mean, you're going to boost, in my experience, I would have someone's metabolism boost by five, 600, 800 calories, depending on the person. That's like an hour of cardio every yeah. day, just sitting there. Think about what flexibility that just created for you. Oh my God. It's another meal you could eat, or you just get leaner eating what you're currently eating. It's like investing money. I, I can put my money somewhere where it makes money for me. And I just sit at home while I make money, or I could go try and work more hours. You can go ahead and try and work more hours. By the way, your body learns how to tax you more when you do that. It's just like it's just like you would with taxes. Mm -hmm. But with this, it's tax free. Think of it that way, and it and it builds for you. Speeding up the metabolism is the most effective strategy for fat loss. This is why when you hear me say powerlifting is great for fat loss, this is why it's one, number one reason. I'm so glad you said that because somebody's going to clip that and they're going to do a counter argument to what you yeah. just said. So I want to arm the trainers and clients out there with this discussion because it's one of the, one of my pet peeves is the research around how how many calories more your body burns for every pound of muscle you have is there's massive debate around that. Ugh. I've seen it as low as like five or 10 calories a day to as high as like 60 calories a yeah. day. Mm. And arguing over the science of what we have on what exactly is that is not the whole story. The metabolism is far more complex then you'd be able to measure just the, the metabolic rate of one, one pound of tissue. So don't allow some dork who just got out of school who wants to take that clip and argue it and say like, that's not true. Even if you added five pounds of muscle, so it only equate to about 75 calories and 75 no. calories is insignificant because one, we still don't know everything about the metabolism. We're still trying to, we're trying to figure it out Two, There's also huge behavioral changes yeah. that happens to somebody who adds five or 10 pounds of muscle to their body. Yeah. They don't okay? measure any of that. They're right. You're, I guarantee anybody listening right now, nothing else changes in your life, but you add five to 10 more pounds. Watch how much more you move, Yeah, you know, and watch how much more effective <coughs> you are when you move inside the gym and how much stronger you are. And there's, there's this, effect better that, decisions you make uh, nutritionally there's a rippling effect of positive benefits that happen to you metabolically physically physiologically from adding five to ten pounds of muscle on you that is cannot be measured in a lab and compared to fat burns this muscle burns this and unfortunately our community in space will take a clip that i guarantee someone's going to clip that sal you know what and 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 they'll try and make yeah. this argument that you're full of shit or you don't know what you're talking look, about. Trainers and coaches that do reverse dieting with competitors or work with people. They and know. Look at their, they, we know this. Yeah. By the way, there's a range of calories you could burn within the same with the same lean body mass. So your body can become more thrifty or less thrifty whether you gain or lose a single pound or not. It doesn't matter. Your body can decide to burn more calories, less calories, and there's it's a very complex system. But if you're training to build muscle, you're in the process of building muscle, you're feeding your body to do so, all those things point towards becoming less thrifty with calories means you have a faster metabolism. I've had people's metabolism boost even more than the numbers I, I, listen, that I mentioned. I, the story yeah. I share about Melissa Wolf, you can find her on Instagram and ask her if this is a true story or not. It's the last person that I train. If you based it off of what the research says on pounds of muscle, it would be impossible for me to have increased her calories to what it did. But not only did we do so, we did so and then won a show by doing that. Yeah. And when I got her, she was at like 1,900 calories or less. We worked her all the way up to like 27, 2,800 calories. Little tiny little thing. And we did that in a relatively short period of time. She most certainly did not put on 50 pounds of muscle <laughs> in that period of time. So where did all that extra yeah. calorie burning come from? And it wasn't me increasing her activity like crazy because before prep, I had her doing zero cardio. So go explain that to me. It's like... We don't, we haven't quite fully wrapped our brains around exactly all the different mechanisms that it's affecting and how it works. I can tell you from firsthand though, I've done this hundreds of times with clients. It's extremely effective and I have seen metabolisms roaring. And even myself, you guys have heard me share the journey on here. 
that there's been times on this podcast in the last eight years when at 5,500 calories, I would lose weight. Yeah. If I eat 5,500 calories right now, I'll pile on like crazy. I can't even eat over 3,000 right now because I'm, in a, I'm a total different person right now. So that's how much you can radically shift the metabolism. So don't let some dork tell you that's not true. <laughs> okay, call them dorks. It also, look, powerlifting training or training for strength also discourages overtraining. One of the, the, the biggest hurdles for anybody starting a fitness program, especially women, because they tend to want weight loss more so than men even, is that they overtrain. They think if some exercise is good, more is better. That's not true at all. The right dose will give you the best results. More than that will give you worse results. Less than that will give you rest, less results. So how does powerlifting discourage overtraining? If you overtrain, you're not going to get stronger. You'll get weaker. Mm -hmm. If you're training hard and you're not getting stronger and then you add more training and then you start to get weaker, uh-oh, I must be overtraining. I got to back off. If you're training for strength, this is one of the times, look, if you're training for the mirror, if you're just doing subjective, right? It'll be very hard for me to get you to back off on your training and even realize the benefit. You'll look in the mirror and be like, I think I look better. I'm not sure, but I am training less. But if I have you back off your training and you go up 15 pounds on your deadlift, it's right there. Oh, you were overtraining. Look, you got stronger from training less because you were overtraining before. And, and just to put it more clearly, training for strength encourages proper workout programming. You can't train improperly. You can't have a crappy workout program and consistently get stronger. You can't fool the body when it comes to strength for too long. Maybe initially, when you first get started, for the first few months, you'll get stronger doing almost anything. But then you'll stop and you'll not get stronger unless you have a well-written, well-planned workout. And powerlifting encourages it because, again, it's objective. The reason why this is such a strong point is because, one, I think this is extremely common across the board. I think a, a, a lot of people, especially fitness enthusiasts, uh, grossly overtrain. I especially think a lot of women overtrain in relation to the calories they consume Definitely. because the most common move is to cut calories and increase activity. And when they mm -hmm. don't see the body moving or changing, they just keep increasing. Add, add, add. Yeah, they just keep increasing the activity and reducing the calories and have no idea they're getting further and further in that direction of overtraining. And to your point about getting stronger, it's it's so objective that even if you got a little bit of newbie gains because you just started by overtraining and under eating, eventually that kit catches up really quick and you have to solve that in order to see yourself get stronger. Well, and one of the other things I love about this style of training is it just highlights the importance of rest and how uh, yes. a lot of these other programs that most women that I would train uh, would uh, basically they were doing cardio with weights in every single session, every single workout they've ever done. Uh, and that's just because of what's out there in the marketplace. Uh, it's, it's this busy, do more, more, more in order to, to keep leaning out and get to your desired outcome where this just shows you how you can increase strength and you, you take longer rest periods in between completely different mindset shift. And then hopefully that then translates going back in the importance of rest in between sets. Right. Um, now you guys mentioned this earlier, but uh, I love talking about the empowering feeling that getting stronger produces for women. This was one of my favorite comments that I would get from female clients is they would come in and they would say something like, um, you know, I had one, one woman that I trained, she was this really petite executive and she would travel a lot. And I remember she came in, this was after maybe four or five months of training. She's like, Oh my God, uh, the craziest thing happened. I'm like, what? She's like, I didn't need to ask it. She was real small. She's like five foot. I didn't need to ask anyone help for help putting my suitcase in the overhead compartment on the plane. And I kind of chuckled. I was a young trainer. She said, you have no idea, Sal. She goes, I travel all the time for work. I always have to ask some guy or flight attendant to help me. She's like, it's almost like I'm dependent. She's like, I did it myself. And it's because I'm so much stronger. And I thought about that. Like, what would that feel like? Right. Mm. I've had other female clients say things like, oh my God, I was holding both my kids all day long and I didn't get tired. Or I was, I picked up four grocery bags or the water delivery came and it's, I didn't have to wait for my husband. I picked it up and did it myself. To feel stronger is to feel more able-bodied. It's empowering. It feels incredible. When you get a, when, when a woman can squat her body weight or more than her body weight for the first time and she looks at that bar and you say, you know, that was 135 pounds. And they're like, oh my God, I just lifted 130. I remember I had a female client 
lift her husband's body weight. I asked her, how much does your husband <laughs> weigh? She's like 185 pounds. Yeah. I'm like, that. he just squatted. And her eyes, she's like, oh my God, I, I squatted my husband? Like, that's insane. It's an incredibly empowering feeling to get stronger. And a lot of women don't experience this because workouts that are especially designed for women don't talk about strength like it's this, it's almost like the side effect, like, oh, burn body fat, sweat, get sore. You'll get a little stronger too. It's not the primary effect. Training for powerlifting, it's the primary effect. And let me tell you, it feels amazing. Yeah, I think it's important that the coaches and trainers learn to highlight this and point this out more. I know you're going to get a lot of clients that come in and tell you that they need to lose weight and they want to do that, but shifting, helping them shift their mindset in this because it's nice. You have a client who's got to lose 30, 40, 50 pounds and you got a journey ahead of you. And one of the things that you can hang on to or celebrate with them are these strength gain wins along the way. Mm -hmm. And if you teach them and un help them understand how impactful and important that is and how much that's a signal that you're doing the things right, right? You got to let them know that. Like, listen, if we are eating like we're supposed to, we're taking care of your body stress management wise, you're getting good rest, we're feeding the body the nutrients it needs to grow and build, you're getting stronger. And if you're not getting stronger, it's because we're missing on those things. So even though I know we have this 40 pound journey we got to get to, we're hitting some really important milestones right now. I want you to know that. So make sure you celebrate those wins and communicate that to them because it's incredibly empowering to let your client know, even if they have this big journey ahead of them, that they're already starting to compile wins. Yeah, That's getting stronger just translates to so many things. I mean, it, it's this confidence builder. It's it and it bleeds in everything. It's it's overcoming any kind of uh, other uh, ad adversity that you're going to face, uh, you know, at work or relationships or anything else. It's just one of those factors of, of training. I don't think uh, people put enough emphasis on it. It's, yeah. it's all weight loss. Agreed. All right. Th this, this, this last point I love because uh, one of my favorite things to do with female clients who struggled with uh, eating issues, dysfunctional eating, body image issues, um, female clients that uh, just had challenges with, uh, you know, the, the way I was trying to train them because they always had worked out a particular way. They needed to get sore and sweat a lot. Otherwise it wasn't effective is I would encourage them to sign up for a local powerlifting meet. Now, why would I do that? Because they had a, a date that was set. They were training for it and helped them become objective and single-minded with hitting their goal. And then when they got there, the powerlifting community is so supportive and fun it's the it's the best it's one of the best if not the best strength training community that exists. Yeah. Now bodybuilding, physique, bikini, very subjective. It can definitely be fun and supportive, but boy do people really sacrifice themselves and their health going into it because uh, the metrics tend to be very subjective, right? It's how you look. Powerlifting is very different. They're very very supportive. It's very fun and you don't sacrifice. I mean, of course at the extreme levels health is sacrifice. I'm talking about like, you know, local level type of deal. But training into a powerlifting meet, you're your healthiest the day of the meet. You're your strongest the day of the meet. Um, and again, it's a wonderful community. And I've had a few clients do this and get the support and they couldn't believe it. Like, my God, people were cheering for me. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not even competitive. I just did it for myself. But all these people were like so excited, you know, for me to, to, to lift the weight off the floor. It was so awesome. Well, I mean, community is always important, and I think in training, right? I think just think that whether you find that community within your family and your close friends, or you go outside of that and you look for it, and your comparison to bodybuilding, well, what's so accurate about that is that you're right. Like, I don't care what anyone says, bodybuilding is not healthy. There's a there's a very healthy aspect to strength training or powerlifting, right? There's a very healthy. Is there an ex is there extremes and where it becomes unhealthy? Of course, there's extremes, but generally speaking the sport of powerlifting, getting ready for that, prepping for that all the way to the day of the, your competition, you're probably at your healthiest, mm -hmm. you're strong, you're well-fed, you're not depleting yourself or anything like that. Uh, bodybuilding a little bit different in that case. But I mean, this is also what I think, what uh, CrossFit, why CrossFit was so big. Like they they nailed this. They, they figured this piece out of this, you know, building community around the big lifts. I mean, it's literally that. It's yeah. literally these boxes all over the country are these little, you know, hole in the wall garage type gyms that focus on all the major barbell lifts and they have incredible community. And it's why it's so successful. Well, I, I really, I, re, I really, I got it. I wish the trend was not a group of female friends getting together and saying, let's do a bikini contest together. 
so we could all get in shape for summer. I wish it was like, hey, let's sign up for a powerlifting competition. That'd be awesome. You know what's funny about that? They would look, generally speaking, they'd get better results. More women would get better results working out together for a powerlifting competition than the bikini or physique or sure. bodybuilding sure, competition. A lot of people have developed more body image issues, eating disorders, or gotten worse through the get on stage and look and have the judges judge you type of sport versus I got to go lift a heavy weight. I would love to see that trend of mm -hmm. women getting together and saying, we're all training for this competition yeah. coming up in August or whatever. Just a bunch of muscle mommies out it, there. It would, be, it would be super amazing. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out. 30% body fat. For men, this is way too high. This is actually a bit high for women as well. So in today's episode, we're talking about how you can go from 30 to 10. What is 10% body fat? This is when you have a visible six pack. Can you go from 30 to 10%? Yes, it's possible but not if you guess along the way. So we're gonna talk about how you can do that in today's episode. Now there's a huge range, right? Of like body types. Yes. Some people can run uh, a little bit heavier uh, and, or a little bit higher.